athletes think that or people think that when they get their test checked or whatever, if it's not at a certain level, they need to start doing things to get it at a higher level because if their test is high, now I'm going to be able to make all these magical games. What do you think people are getting potentially messed up with that idea or are they correct? So I was thinking like, I'm going to finally get to see like all these fake natties, you know, like, <laughs> I'm going to like, even with you, I got to, I got to be honest. I'm like, I have a list over here. We're going to go over that later. What are the negative side effects, if there are any, of uh, taking like TRT dosages and maybe even high, a little higher to the performance enhancing side. But I swear, I'll look at some kids come in with their SARMs labs and I'm like, you are like, you, you look like you're about to die. Your labs look so bad, you know? So you don't think growth hormone's that effective in general? I'm, I guess if someone had low growth hormone, they took you it's know, a, yeah, a good that's replacement dose, maybe it'd be helpful. Yeah, it's hard. But it's kind of like a anti-aging longevity thing. People make a huge deal about it. Yeah, but I think that is definitely uh, misplaced or misguided in mm. my opinion. Benefits could also be the same like m muscle growth, uh, fat loss and that sort of thing in women. Yeah, but again, we're doing the replacement and so we're replacing that their dosage too, you know, so in a man, maybe that that replacement is only like 100 milligrams and a female, maybe it's like five or 10. And then we utilize kind of some outside the box things in those naturals too that are looking to get some like a, a Tadalafil, Cialis. Cialis has actually been shown to increase free testosterone, to increase androgen receptors as well. Some people have said uh, to take like five milligrams yeah. before training. I've never tried it training wise. It's pretty good. I did it yesterday when we came in here. I took a little because I had to work out with Smokey. I'm like, mm -hmm. I better show up. I better look pumped. I know he's going to take mm -hmm. pictures. Wear some uh, gray sweatpants and yeah. <laughs> take yeah. some Cialis and get a workout in. <laughs> well, Will it mess with the ability of the individual to get hard on their own if they depend too much on Cialis and all this shit to get super hard? No, probably not because the pathway that it works is kind of interesting. Yeah, is this something that we can take like as like a daily vitamin, like an yeah. overdose? dose? No, no yeah. I'm serious. Because if I, I know you're serious. That's because actually how I, we recommend it. Okay, cool. Yeah. Hey guys, I want to tell you about Merrick Health, the premium telehealth clinic owned by Derek for more plates, more dates. Now, when some people think about Merrick Health, uh, they think it's just another one of those testosterone companies or another one of those blood work companies. But Merrick Health is really cool because, yeah, you can get your blood work done, you can get hormone optimization, but you can also get nootropics. You can also get... <laughs> Viagra. You can get <laughs> literally whatever you need from that clinic. And they make it very, very easy for you. That's why we love Merrick. So, Andrew, how can people learn about it? Yes, Merrick Health is not just a one-trick pony, but if you did want to get your labs done, we highly recommend the Power Project panel. That's 28 different labs. That's also going to come with a client care coordinator that's going to give you a lab analysis, and they're going to work with you and help you optimize your body. Again, that's at MerrickHealth.com slash Power Project. At checkout, enter promo code Power Project to save $101 off that entire panel. Links to them down in the description as well as the podcast show notes. And we are now. So what? What is this uh, majestic cereal? Malted milk. Okay, what? no, it's just okay. Look up malted milk and just just bring it up. It um, sounds like something like my grandparents would have made. If you want to make any I've had cereal, it for us, you've had it. Yeah, it's amazing. <laughs> so you know what I'm talking about. You just pour the powder mm -hmm. in whatever bland ass cereal, and the cereal becomes good. I don't know what the macros were on it, but I just <laughs> knew that I put it in every fucking cereal I could. You ever have a malted shake? Uh, oh, yeah. I've heard of that. Yeah. They're they probably amazing. use malted milk and malted yeah. shakes. Yeah. I love They're malt. Really good. Like one of the cereals I eat the most is grape nut flakes. Have you ever had grape nuts? It's like <laughs> super. No, really? Yeah. Never. It's like an old man cereal. It like, sounds you know? way too healthy. <laughs> yeah. Like, do they actually have grapes in it? No. How about nuts? Neither. Okay. It's just, <laughs> I, but they've turned it into a flake and it has that malt flavor. Wow. It, it's delicious. That's got to blow your butthole out pretty good. It does, yeah. It's like pure fiber. Wait, great nut cereal? Okay. You, before it's like this chewing on a tree. Yeah. Before this shit started, you said you're eating kashi and now you bring up grape nut cereal. Have yeah. you been eating this from a kid? From since you were a kid, or is this more of an adult? I'm a man, so I got to eat old cereal. No, no, I, I eat old cereal. I eat bran flakes. And Whoa! Like, yeah. <laughs> but I do have a significant amount of like sugary cereal as well. Not so much anymore, but certainly there was a point in my life where I ate a ton of sugary cereals. Whenever my mom bought that shit, I would just take spoonfuls of sugar <laughs> and just dump it right on top. I was, I was like, actually this is perfect now. I was raised like I, I knew that cornflake thing because mm -hmm. I was raised in that church. Okay. And so, as a child, so a I was cornflake like, yep. church. Yeah. Yeah. The Adventist. Mm. And so I'm. I'm no longer. My, <laughs> and but, Sam was like having second thoughts. Yeah. Now. <laughs> you got to eat and these so, cornflakes. So we ate like I had like Weetabix and like these brands. Like I was raised relatively like with food food centered, pretty healthy ish. Mm. Okay. Kind of different. Yeah. And we'd go through weird like all of a sudden my parents would be like we're vegan now and I'd have to be vegan for a few months and. And then we'd get back to getting some, like I could have chicken or fish again. But. Your parents were fairly health conscious? 
Yeah, for the most part. Like that church, the Adventist church is very like health focused. Um, and so there was always like we were centered around food a lot. Uh-huh. Is it more Christian, Catholic, or is it yeah? No, they're thing? they're Christian. Hmm. Yeah, I've since way grown out of that. But. Right. Uh, the rest of the family pretty health conscious, or mainly just you uh, turn into a meathead over the years? Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, just me yeah, mm-hmm. for sure. Yeah, there's more like a spiritual thing, you know. And then mine was just, uh, my mom was very health conscious. I think growing up, mm-hmm. um, yeah, like when she was pregnant with me, she had, before being uh, before being pregnant, she had signed up for a like a marathon, or I think it was a triathlon or something. It was like eight months into pregnancy with me, and was like, "Fuck it, I'm doing it." Mm-hmm. Like. I signed up for it, so I've got that Whoa. stubbornness and like that. Yeah, shit. Probably wasn't the best for me. I came out late and almost died and stuff. Oh. <laughs> well, how'd she do? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, that's what matters I, most, right? Yeah. I just heard these things through the years. Like, yeah, your mom's crazy. Yeah, Quinn was like stuck in there. I don't know what she was doing. Mm. She came uh, very late. So it's just uh, sometimes, I guess, just circumstances. Maybe not. Maybe it wasn't the running, or maybe it was hard to say. Yeah, I don't know. It's pretty comfortable in there, though. I is. bet. You know, there are people that apparently remember what it was like to be in the womb. When people say that shit, I'm just like, dude, I don't believe it. I don't believe it either. Yeah. But they claim to. It was probably really dark. <laughs> like, exactly, right? Like, you sure you're not just remembering last night when you slept? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, your eyes aren't open. You're just sleeping. Yeah. Like, Jesus. Did you do a lot of sports as a kid, too? I actually didn't. Yeah, I did almost zero. I skateboarded most of my life, like, growing, well, when I was younger. Just didn't yeah. have much exposure to it or didn't want to do it or. Um, little, so kind of played into that whole like crazy Christianity that we were grown up into. We, uh, had to go to church on like Saturdays and it was very regimented. And so we weren't really allowed to do that many competitive sports because a lot of them happened on the weekend. Um, then I kind of just started rebelling pretty hard and like grew my hair out, dyed it black and was wearing like skinny jeans and skateboarding. Were you an skinny. emo kid? I wasn't emo. I was more like punk. I was. I hated the emo kids. <laughs> if I looked like an emo kid, okay. and from the outside, you'd be like emo kid. But I was like, fuck emo. Like I'm hardcore. I'm punk. <laughs> like, yeah. Makes yeah. a lot of sense. Yeah, but I oh. I was an emo kid. Yeah. Okay. If you were gonna class them, categorize them, yeah, yeah, I fit into that. How'd you get in, into uh, some lifting weights? How'd Man, you get into that? Yeah. So that that was a uh, lifting weights and everything basically changed the entire trajectory of my life because. Yeah, for a, a while there, like I was skating, kind of messed around, partying a lot, doing drugs, doing stupid shit. Um, one, like, I had to enroll in college. My parents basically at like 18, you know, or whatever, when I graduated in high school, they were like, you got to either enroll in college or get out. Like, if you're going to stay here, you got to be doing something. Mm-hmm. Good for them. Um, so I signed up a lot. I just never went. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, like my first semester went by and I just failed everything because they don't kick you out of college, you know. I, right. In high school, I, you know, I figured like, well, they're just going to drop me, whatever. And then I get that, like, I don't know, report card. Is that what it is still in college? I can't remember. But all zeros, like Fs, you know. And I'm like, oh, fuck, this isn't good. Like, I just wasted their money. Mm. And I'm like, I'm, this isn't good. Um, and then I just kind of got in trouble with doing something else stupid. And I'm like, I need to change my life. I'm not doing shit. So one day, I just literally one day cut off all my hair. I got this tattoo. It says... Uh, basically with it or on it was what the Spartans used to say like when they go to war like give it this year all or die trying Um, because they would go out with their shield and then it was like come back with your shield or dead on your shield you know because and I was like getting really into the Spartans I'm like these are men like what I'm doing is just dicking around like (laughs) These are these were badass dudes. They were defending like their their countrymen and I think everything. They would you know? fuck each other though too. So be careful <laughs> I think they how did deep you get into the being a spark. I think now they did a we're going. That. <laughs> Let's go. They would just penetrate the thighs. So yeah, it was, yeah. no it was, thigh wars. Yeah, dude, you're you're absolutely right though. I think they did because they were like. <laughs> If you love the dude next to you, yeah. you're, like, you're gonna fight so much harder. If you, if you <laughs> this isn't the month for this type of conversation. Yeah. <laughs> You've already gotten enough backlash, and now you're wearing a pink shirt. I know. Well, <laughs> it's an like appropriate time for me to bring it up. Uh, it was, Smokey and I went down this road, <laughs> being part of Team Super Training. It was important. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah so I, I changed everything. I uh, I got a gym membership, and then getting like working out was something I was getting super into. And I've kind of always been the I'm gonna give everything 110 or nothing. Like mm-hmm. I go. Like, like that's why I was way submerged in that skateboarding culture and everything. And yeah. it's all I did. So then I started working out and that's all I did. I'd get home. I'd be on the, at first, like the bodybuilding.com forum mm-hmm. and stuff, you know, learning everything and then venturing out, like bought a physiology book and I'm starting to learn. So I re-enrolled in college. So I'm like, I really like the science stuff. Um, started taking science courses, became a personal trainer. And I'm like, I think I need a little bit more. You know, this isn't, 
it's not fulfilling enough, um, but I really have a passion for this stuff. So mm-hmm. then I just continued in college. I uh, transferred out of community college, went to a university. Um, at that point, I was kind of thinking like, I want to do something in medicine. Um, I never thought that I could go on to be a doc um, just because I felt like I didn't come from that pedigree, basically, you know? I thought those were kids that were on like yachts and going to Harvard and, and stuff. And I'm like, I started a community college. I'm never going to be a doctor. So you know, maybe I could be like a, a nurse or, or a PA or something. Maybe um, I started shadowing this doctor, he was a super successful dermatologist. And he kind of told me his story. It was very similar, except for he was a surfer. Didn't even get into med school until he was 30. Wow. I'm like, oh, cool. So mm. you can kind of, there's alternate paths and not every, not all doctors fall into this one category, all sorts of walks of life, you know? Um, so then I kind of went down that road, but yeah, fitness was the catalyst there. Like working out changed everything because as soon as I dove into that, I started loving science and, Mm. you know, one thing led to another, I just kept progressing down the road. And what type of doctor did you pursue? Yeah. So when I was working for that, um, dermatologist, I loved it. Like dermatology was super cool. I liked the mixture of clinic and they did a lot of little minor surgeries, um, I was also shadowing orthopedic surgeon at the time. My dad's good friend is an orthopedic surgeon. Or orthopedic surgeon. Um, so I was loving the bone surgery stuff too. Um, I knew I wanted to do either one of those. Uh, when you go the traditional MD or DO route, you have to pick at the end mm-hmm. before you go to residency, the training. Um, not only do you have to pick, but you have to match into these programs, which can be extremely difficult to do. Both of those are like top pain specialties, extremely hard to get into. Quick question. Yes. The difference between MD and DO? Not much. Okay. Uh, I agree. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So MD is a medical doctor. DO is a doctor of osteopathic medicine. In the past, they used to do a lot more body manipulations. It kind of, it was like a MD with a little bit of chiropractic in there. Now they, most of the graduating DOs don't do much of that from what I know. Um, yeah. At the end of the day, they're the same exact thing in yeah. my opinion. Um, so yeah, I'm like, dang, I, I'm going to have to choose between those one day. That sucks. Um, and then we had a nail condition come in, and uh, the doctor brought his friend in who was a podiatrist, a foot and ankle specialist, because mm-hmm. um, they do a lot of um, you know, nail procedures. And so I get to talking to him, and he's like, yeah, before this, I just fixed an ankle fracture. I'm like, that's that orthopedic surgery stuff I like. And now you're here doing skin stuff on the nails with us. Like, you get to do both these things. And so at that point, I was like, he's, that's what I, that's my dream, you know, skin and nails and, like, and some bones. And like, that's awesome. Yeah. Like, this is melting. So yeah, I decided to pick podiatry, which is a different school too. And it's a different degree. So there's MD, DO and DPM. And I'm wow. a DPM. So we focus like from day one on the foot and ankle. Wow, some man. people are really disgusted by feet. <laughs> I mean, lot I'm, of, I'm pretty weird, disgusted by feet. <laughs> a lot of weird stuff can happen to your feet, right? Yeah. I right. mean, this guy had to get like a bone so, uh, sawed down, I think, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Bunionette yeah. surgery. Yeah, so yeah. They Taylor's <laughs> bunion or bunionette. Exactly. So they shaved it and put something in there. Yeah. Yeah. A little screw. Uh, exactly. Yeah. A little screw. I yeah. think it's still there. That's yeah, crazy. Probably. Yeah. yeah, feet are disgusting. I don't like feet either. <laughs> Whenever people ask me, like, you have a foot fetish? I'm like, absolutely not. This would be the worst <laughs> thing to get into if I had a foot fetish. Like, they would be ruined, you know? Like, yeah, feet are disgusting. I have a cool question because we've been getting into, like, a lot of foot development stuff as of recent. Um, and I, I know, like, I guess you're not focused on feet anymore. But when you would see different patients, was there any stark difference you noticed between a foot of a, a really good athlete, if you ever got your hands on those types yeah. of feet, versus gen pop? Um yeah. So, well, first, I really hardly got my feet on or my hands on uh, good athletes. You know, okay. uh, most of what comes through podiatry clinics, like eighty to ninety percent, are are patients with diabetes who mm-hmm. have just terrible feet. Um, occasionally, we do get some sports med in. There are podiatrists that really specialize, like out here in uh, the Bay Area. There's um, Doctor Saxena. He's a big one, world renowned. Like flies up to Nike a lot. And mm-hmm. so there are like specialists who do sports med, but we don't see it too much. Um, but no, that's actually. That's something interesting too. I uh, I think you actually turned me on to Dr. Um, Andrew Bryan. Is that he's an Australian like minimalist shoe? Mm-hmm. Doc, you know. Yep. Yeah, I saw you post this thing one day, so I started following him. Recently, he posted this post of uh, Usain Bolt and uh, LeBron James' feet. Did you see that one? I did. Yeah. I did. And they're just destroyed. They are wrecked. And he's like, mm-hmm. does this mean that like they're not good athletes? You know, would they have better? Would they be better athletes if their feet weren't this way? Probably not. You know. So it's kind of interesting. Um, athletes might have really destroyed terrible feet too, but, but everybody's different. And so that's one thing that I'm always saying, like we can't really 
throw everybody into these classifications of like your foot needs to be this way. You know, um, everybody's a little bit different. Maybe their feet were just chucked into shoes that weren't working great for them and their yeah. feet got kind of mangled over the years but didn't have any any uh, negative side effects. Yeah, could be. Or maybe their feet are just mangled because right. that's how their genetics are or something, you know. Like, it's super interesting. It's yeah. interesting when people talk about problems or issues how uh, a lot of times there's not an actual symptom yeah. attached to it. I mean, sometimes it's a good idea to investigate certain things just to make sure that you're healthy and that you're heading in the right direction. With with myself, uh, my sleep has been a challenge for a few years. And then more recently, I think I have most of it solved. I'm sleeping longer and stuff like that. But it's making me really groggy. And, and previously, I didn't really feel like I had any symptoms. Uh, however, I'm just like, well, not sleeping doesn't seem like a great idea. Yeah. Um, but I don't know, for whatever reason, maybe I was able to condition myself to that or, uh, I'm not really sure, but in a lot of what you're doing, uh, with Merrick Health now, um, does it seem like a lot of people are coming to you just to, uh, want to make advancements and they don't really have a lot of symptoms and you have to try to, Yeah. I mean, you're trying to service, uh, the client in so some way and give them what they want right. or what they think they want, but you probably have to steer them a little bit towards, well, hey, you should be really grateful and thankful that you don't have any symptoms right now. You actually are heading in a pretty good direction. Yeah. And here's what I suggest kind of thing. Yeah, I'm huge on that. Like symptoms are big. And, and what we do at Merrick is a lot of the subjective of how you feel. Um, we definitely correlate it with lab work and we do crazy extensive lab work, which is awesome. And a lot of people just come just to get a, a peek at that, which is cool. But symptoms are really the huge driver, uh, even like with feet, you know, like if you have a Taylor's bunion or an actual bunion or you have a flat foot, but you're not in pain, there's no need to throw an orthotic in there or do a surgery or something like that, you know, and the same goes with, uh, you know, the hormone replacement and stuff. Like if you come to us and your testosterone's 300, but you're like, I'm making great gains. I'm my libido's amazing. You know, my recovery's good. My motivation's there. Like, why do you need 800 testosterone? You know, is there, is there really a difference? Like maybe you are somebody who works really well at 300. Okay. Yeah. So this, I'm, we're, we're just hitting it right off the bat. Yeah. <laughs> um, Andrew, can you look up <clears throat> coach Eugene Tiao? The Eugene uh, Instagram? Yeah, 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 yeah. His Instagram. And the reason why I want to mention this guy is because he's super jacked. Uh, he's going to be on the podcast at some point. But his testosterone is not necessarily high, right? And there are many athletes who uh, you were mentioning. You, you mentioned a few people. Um, but athletes think that or people think that when they get their test checked or whatever, if it's not at a certain level, they need to start doing things to get it at a higher level. Because yeah. if their test is high, now I'm going to be able to make all these magical gains. What do you think people are getting potentially messed up with that idea, or are they correct? Yeah, I think it varies for each individual. Um, so, yeah, that, when I came to Merrick, I was kind of thinking, like, because we get a lot of, uh, like, you know, we got, like, you guys with us. We get these high-end athletes that come to us, and I'm like, I'm going to finally be able to, uh, oh, yeah. That's him, by yeah, the way. He's he, definitely jacked. His, his test isn't high. He's natural, and he makes great gains. Yeah. Yeah, so I was thinking, like, I'm going to finally get to see, like, all these fake natties, you know? Like, <laughs> I'm going to, like, even with you, I, I got to I gotta be honest. I'm like, I have a list over here. We're going to go over yeah. that later. And I'm, scared. you know, <laughs> like, I'm now your doc at, at Merrick Health. I'm going to see you later. So I was looking over your labs. And I mean, and he did not tell me to do this. We, this is the first time we've talked, but I looked yeah. and you have natural numbers, at least of right now. Like, right. I can't say, I cycled what off, bro. Yep, I can't say what you've us. done for the rest of your life, cycled but <laughs> he's natty right now, which is like, <laughs> I was actually surprised to, uh, how many athletes. <laughs> athletes come through who legitimately don't have amazing numbers. And so I think that sometimes people are misguided just by the number of testosterone. Like you don't need to have a 1500 testosterone to have amazing gains. Everybody's physiology is a little bit different. So there's a lot going on. There's the, uh, the androgen receptor could be an argument, like how, how much, how many androgen receptors do you have? What's the density? What's the quality of them? Um, like, it, you know, it's been theorized that some of these super responders, like, you know, the bodybuilders, the ones that step on the Olympia stage, like it's been theorized, potentially they have more density of these androgen receptors, potentially their transcription of the DNA occurs differently than ours do. Maybe they have different like mechanical growth factor. That's like an, uh, IGF, uh, of the muscle. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's so many other factors, not just the testosterone. Um, yeah, cause I've seen like a three, a guy with a 300, you know, look like something like that. And then I've seen a guy with a 2000 running all kinds of shit. And how does a person have like 2000, just normal, that's no, no, no. Their test. even, even oh, like, okay. A, yeah. Mm -hmm. okay, okay. But I have seen some pretty elevated ones too, mm -hmm. where it's like 1500 natural and they're definitely, they're working out, not making that great of gains, you know, 
everybody's a little bit different. And and to to sit, like base everything off a number is just silly, I think. Is there some other number? Is there like free testosterone mm-hmm. or is there so, some sort of ratio that if you get people in that ratio, does it seem like they tend to make a lot of progress? Sometimes, yeah. Um, yeah, so like the free is definitely something that we're going to look at. So the uh, the free testosterone is basically the testosterone that can be utilized theoretically. I think we're... Um, there's some research recently where free maybe isn't as important as we used to think, mm-hmm. but either way, um, free means that it's not bound to a protein, so either albumin or sex hormone binding globulin. Um, when it's not bound, it can potentially be more readily used. Um, and so, yeah, getting that free up is really what we're trying to do. Um, that's another thing, though, too. We do see sometimes, and what, that's why it's nice to kind of go to a place like Merrick rather than just to your doc, because there is some where a guy has like a, an 800 testosterone, but their free testosterone is in the gutter. It's like five or something, so very low. Mm-hmm. And they're having all the symptoms of low testosterone, but their doc's been telling them for years, you have fine testosterone, you have fine. Well, maybe not. Maybe we need to look at the free, and then we need to look at why is their sex hormone binding globulin so high, you know, these kind of things, and address that as the individual, because it all, again, comes down to the individual. The interesting thing about like this industry, um, fitness or bodybuilding specifically, especially when guys are trying to get bigger, bigger, is that it's we take a really small view at this one thing test yeah. because guys end up taking tests. They're like, right. what's the test? The test needs to be higher. But we don't like you were mentioning all these different factors that allow people to do what they do. Um, it's going to be interesting finding out and learning from you what other things people should be paying attention to. Because like, for example, you know, who Giannis Antetokounmpo is in the NBA. Place for the Bucks. He's like, oh, oh, yeah, yeah, Giannis. Yeah, okay, yeah, Giannis, yeah. right? Yeah. So people look at him. He's called the Greek Freak. His yeah. brothers are also very fucking large, um, but he has a 13 inch Achilles tendon. I thought you like, were going to say 13 inch something. <laughs> 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 I mean, who fucking knows with that tendon, right? But he has a 13 inch Achilles tendon, and that is like double the human, like double the size of everybody else's normal Achilles, which is why you wonder why does he have this jumping strength and power, et cetera. Like he's literally, he has certain aspects that you cannot replicate, yeah. right? Um, so but his calves like, don't look um, as good as Mark's, man. <laughs> they don't. His yeah. calves are like, that's hey. a terrible, <laughs> that's a terrible problem. Black man calves. It's I think thing. Uh, <laughs> Michael, Michael Phelps has like a size 15 or 16 foot, mm-hmm. you know? So he's like these things that people are born with. He's like got giant hands. Crazy and wingspan. His yeah. wingspan represents someone, I think, that's like seven foot three. Yeah. And, he's and like his six, torso five. versus his legs. There's something weird there, too. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. His yeah. torso is really is, long and he has short really short legs for his height yeah yeah like short um yeah like uh the, the femur mm-hmm. and it's not just the testosterone winning him those medals you know it's no, so many right. other factors but people yeah. will say he's on shit because he's an olympic athlete and well they make money so mm-hmm. why don't you take drugs and i mean maybe he probably is on shit. <laughs> <laughs> he probably is i would i would say so too but i don't think that's the thing that's winning him the medals you know now there's I some mean, weird stories surrounding him like where he just uh, had time off for a little while and he just gained a bunch of muscle and his coach was like, hey, what's going on here? Yeah. I mean, there's people that are just, there are people that are outliers. For some reason, we have a really hard time accepting it. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, look at like uh, like Phil Heath. Uh, yeah. you know, like when he was in his basketball years, like I don't, you can probably find that if you Google what Phil Heath looked like when he played college ball. Mm-hmm. Like the dude looks like you. He started he wasn't when he was lit. 12. <laughs> he, like, he started oh, getting oh, on yeah. shit when he was 12. <laughs> he didn't though, right? No, like, I'm, yeah, I'm kidding. kidding. <laughs> I, mean, I just I that's mean, what people you, say. That's yeah. what people will Whoa. say. And then uh, Ronnie, I think uh, yeah. Ronnie w- like competed his first Olympia natural. I don't think he has any reason to lie about that because he was open about it the rest of the time, you know? Yeah. And he was like, yeah, my first Olympia, I was natty. And you can mm-hmm. tell he's relatively small. Yeah, like, look at that. Jesus. Jesus. So he wasn't training for bodybuilding. He was just training as an athlete. Like he was training. It would be yeah, tra- it would be counterproductive to train as a bodybuilder as a basketball player, you know? <laughs> Dude, I've 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 seen a picture of Phil Heath, but nothing like this. But dog, his That's delts, crazy. his biceps, and yeah. he's playing basketball all the time. Right. <laughs> so then you give somebody like that, you know, you put them into the super physiologic levels uh, on top of the work ethic and everything that they're doing. Yeah, you're gonna grow a monster. But like I never looked like that <laughs> when I was in college, you know, and I will never. It'd be good to just know his story, like when he was done playing basketball, when he just played basketball less and just lifted. Do you know what I mean? Like he probably instantly gained a bunch of weight. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But I mean, most guys would love to look like him in his uh, natty, untrained state. Of course. You know, that's like the goal. And I, I don't think he was running testosterone then, you know. So actually, this this is interesting because a lot of people will call into these clinics and will get their blood work done, and the main number they want to pay attention to is their testosterone. But if people are getting their blood work done, what other things, as far as their performance, do you think they should keep their mind on and actually look at 
other than your test, take a look at these other things to yeah. see if see what you should change. And there's so many things. And that's uh, like if you come to Merrick too, what we're doing, like, you know, you guys know the, the lab panel that we're getting is insane. You know, mm -hmm. you're, we're testing like 20, 30, 40, sometimes different lab markers. Your things like 12, 15 pages because there's so much that goes into human optimization from health standpoints, but also to performance. So things like performance, like we were talking about before, um, prolactin is like one that I never thought about, Yeah, really. Um, mm -hmm. And I was telling you guys, you know, I basically – I was kind of uninterested in sex for a while. And, you know, I'm, I'm here sitting thinking that I'm just, you know, aging. I'm getting older. I'm getting more mature. Like, you know, I care more about work than, you know, my beautiful fiance is next to me. But yeah, it's cool. And then I, uh, I get my labs tested. My prolactin's out the roof. Yeah. And, you know, that's something. And the prolactin can be causing that low libido that people are coming to us saying. But downstream could be affecting your performance as well. Mm -hmm. um, estrogen, too. And estrogen, I think people think about in the wrong way a lot because estrogen is hypertrophic in its own regard, too. So you want to screw up your gains, like lower your estrogen too much. And there's people walking around with like no estrogen. They're just taking these aromatase inhibitors thinking that that's what they're supposed to do. Probably not. So yeah, we got prolactin, estrogen. We got the free testosterone we talked about. We got the IGF numbers, uh, which that's debatable, but um, something to look at too. Even just your normal, uh, your minerals and things like that. You know, so many different things to look at. Yeah, there's a lot. There's a lot of to, that goes into it. And uh, recently, I was uh, on Tom Segura's podcast, and we were going back and forth about stuff. And uh, he was he was asking about performance enhancing drugs. He's mm -hmm. asking about steroids. And I said, you know what, man? I said, unfortunately, like it's a big story. Like there's a lot to know. He's like, all I need to know is where to get them. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a lot of people that probably come to you guys that are probably kind of hunting for it. And what yeah. is your advice to? you know, uh, a 25 year old guy who's just like, you know, trying to get a little bit bigger. Yeah, that's hard. Um, so there's a part of me that's very like libertarian and I'm like, whatever you want to put in your body you should really be allowed to. Yeah. But at the same time, I, I am a doctor and we're treating people medically and, and our license says for whatever stupid reason that we cannot give, uh, steroids in order for performance enhancing, which is kind of crazy. It's like, you can't make people have more muscle and less body fat. But you know, that's another story for another time, you know, but it's, it's kind of crazy. hormones to be a like, different sex yeah. and that would be okay. Yeah. Or like, you know, uh, something that recently I thought about, like, you know, as a podiatrist, I prescribed a lot of times like, uh, like toenail fungus type stuff. Um, toenail fungus is not going to hurt anything. So getting rid of it is basically aesthetic, right? Like it's mm -hmm. only for aesthetics. Mm -hmm. The medication that we give, the terbinifens, antifungal, terrible for your liver, terrible for your markers. So I'm like, I'm allowed to just give that for beauty purposes. But if a guy wants to have bigger biceps, they can't take <laughs> testosterone. Mm -hmm. Like they literally, the laws are the same as like heroin. It's crazy mm -hmm. to me. But uh, <laughs> yeah, anyway, so that's like one part of it is there's that part of my mind. that's like, man, I'm sorry. I can't just help you to do this safely. Because I do feel like you should be able to have a little bit of control. Um, but unfortunately, we are governed by the laws. since what it is. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, and I, I would probably try to talk these guys into anyways. Like, maybe you should just dial in every other aspect of your life first. You know, uh, these guys will come. And sometimes their their complaints are basically like, you know, I can't put on weight. I'm like, okay, what are you eating? They can't even really tell me. And then it's like, oh, well, you know, I have like a six inch sub at like lunch and then uh like at meat dinner like maybe some spaghetti or something like dude see so start there like even you know dial in your food like like just do that first and then come back to me after you're eating like four thousand calories consistently mm. of like you know the muscle building foods um you know and then and then what's your sleep like oh well, like most nights i stay up till like one playing video games or something you know and then i got to get up for like class at seven okay dial that in too like let's dial all this stuff in before we take that plunge because you're potentially looking at getting on like at 20, you're, you know, maybe you're in, you're going to need to run it till you're like 80. So 60 years of pinning, you're, you're ready to do that, you know, like a few times a week. That's crazy. Wait, so quick question about the 20 to 80 thing. Why do you, why is it that when people get on, they, the typical trend is that they must be on for, or they will be on for part of the rest of their life. Why yeah. is that? So I, unfortunately, I don't think it's, I mean, more recently it's been the trend where more people are kind of wising up and, and kind of realize that you need to get on and stay on before and like coming up mark you probably knew what people would blast and post cycle mm -hmm. therapy and I, I think that's probably really unhealthy yeah people um, do like 12 or 16 week cycles yeah and things like that and, and then, then they, they run off. like clomid and hcg and right. stuff to come off and crash but so what happens is your body's really smart about things and it, it's going to sense that it's getting testosterone from an outside source mm -hmm. and so it shuts down the system um and so you quit producing testosterone 
And if that goes on for long enough, um, you can just be stuck where you're not making testosterone anymore. Also, having high levels of androgens and things have been shown to be toxic to the testes, actually. So the, the Leydig cells that produce testosterone, if you're on too high of androgens for too long, you may damage them and make it so they're no longer producing testosterone. So when you get off, you're, you know, you're down to the levels of a female. And so that's why we say if you get on, you're probably going to need to stay on. Have you assisted people in coming off? We have. So yeah, it, it's a lot easier, I'd say, to come off of TRT than like mm. performance enhancing doses. You know, When we're talking like a dose of 100 to 120, maybe 150 milligrams a week versus a, a bodybuilding cycle where they're doing maybe a gram, which is a thousand you know, milligrams of these things, like that's different. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, we certainly do assist people to get off, usually for fertility re reasons. So mm. It's a big one that people come off. Um, you know, they, they get off because they can kind of, uh, that same system um, where the testosterone production is very closely related to fertility. And so when they come off, they can easier, uh, they have an easier time, you know, conceiving. So that, that's one and of the things. And has that been successful? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, we use that. It's like, good to know because sometimes people are like, ah, you know, it might wipe you out forever. Yeah. And, but I I, mean, there is that possibility that maybe before you ever went on, you didn't know whether you were compatible with your yeah. mate uh, previously. That's a big. That's what I tell pretty much every guy when they're uh, coming to us and they're curious and they're, they're a candidate for uh, TRT and they want to. I tell them if fertility is at all a concern, like get it tested before getting on, and if you have good viable sperm, get them frozen. You know, just have a backup plan. Kind of sucks because we see bodybuilders who wildly abuse this stuff for years they have tons of children and then occasionally mm -hmm. there's a guy on trt with a really low dose and all of a sudden they're infertile right you know and we as far as i know i don't think we have the data that show the exact number like you know 25 percent of every guy will become infertile. we don't have that it's like really just a crapshoot like each person's very individual that way do you have a hypothesis of that like do you have a like from what you've seen and everything you've heard is there something in your head like it might actually end up being this even though there's no hard research and numbers to show um i, I would say more likely than not the fertility is not really an issue no yeah just based on okay. like you know all the bodybuilders and things like you guys probably know so many bodybuilders that have full families like wasn't an issue for them. They likely didn't come off either. That would have hurt their career. They probably stayed on Tran and Anadrol and everything else and pumped off babies, you know, so. I would say, that, I would say, uh, since I'm not a doctor, I could say this. Um, <laughs> I would say it's all reversible and, and it appears to be yeah. reversible. However, you could do so much damage, right? True. And there's individual people that might have pre-existing conditions that uh, lead them to causing more permanent damage. Certainly, yeah. I would uh, agree with that. Our guy, um, what's the gorilla chemist's name? Gorilla chemist. Oh yeah, Brian. Gorilla chemist. <laughs> gorilla chemist is his name. Yeah, yeah, yeah gorilla chemist. Uh, yeah, he came on because he, he Moscow. Was, Brian Moscow. Yeah, yeah. He was talking <laughs> about fertility stuff that was going on with him, and he knew people that were fine, but he himself had to dial things back and figure out ways yeah. to get it back. So yeah, see, super it's super interesting how. Yeah. What yeah. seems to be like cool too, and I haven't really looked into it, but have you seen that? Like, it seems like most guys running high androgens have females. So they mm -hmm. have, they have daughters. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh. I've seen that a lot. Yeah. I've seen that in a lot of like MMA fighters and like just badass dudes. Yeah. Like, yeah. So you think that's more than a statistic that it's like, it's, I don't know. It's something that's like anecdote. I think within our community now, I don't know mm -hmm. if anyone's ever like looked into it, but it seems to be like, it seems to be true. Like all these, these pros and stuff are pumping out daughters. Yeah. And like, uh, Navy seals and like dudes at that, like crazy top level yeah. like they're having a lot of females it's pretty interesting but uh, it's, what about um birth defects like when being on gear like i've heard a lot of dudes say like they want to come off because they want to make sure that they have a healthy baby uh me being one of those dudes but like yeah is there anything any statistics or anything that shows that like if you're on a bunch of shit this could happen if you have a you know, offspring. Yeah. It's, what's hard with that too, is we don't really have a lot of good research on this because just like TRT in and of itself is relatively new. Uh, we also can't do good studies of people running like actually, we can't right. ethically load people up with, you know, tons of steroids and things to see. Um, one could kind of hypothesize that you're probably going to run into some potentially some issues, at least change. Like, you know, uh, I think like Dr. Huberman, Andrew Huberman, you guys have had on, I think he did some research himself on like testosterone and it's, uh, it's differentiations and things that it has on, um, the embryo and the, the fetus and mm -hmm. everything in the womb. It's pretty interesting. So hormones play a big role in development while they're in the womb, yeah. you know, so 
I would suspect there's probably something. And then when you're using like underground labs and things, you're exposing them to like the heavy metals that they're getting, the mm. the terrible, uh, uh, all the things that they're making the the medicaid the drug with, you know. So that can probably be an issue too. Walk our audience through a little bit of what it would be like to be uh, somebody that um, purchases a service of Americ Health. Um, I'm in my 40s, maybe getting closer to 50. Uh, work is stressful. Just life is kind of stressful. It's kicking my ass. I'm uh, 30, 40 pounds overweight. Used to play sports. Don't do much anymore. Not as physical. I go to you guys because I'm like, man, there's just something wrong. Like, I don't feel like I have anything inside anymore. I'm not sleeping well. I, I feel a little bit like a mess and I need to figure this shit out. So I come to you. And where do we start? Like how much blood work or do we need to do? And like, what does this process look like over the next couple of weeks or months? Take yeah. some trend. <laughs> trend. <laughs> yeah, so. Um, and then you just hang up the phone. <laughs> <laughs> what the fuck was that? Trend, trend bro. <laughs> I just log on, do some trend. <laughs> <laughs> this place is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I do think sometimes people think that's what they're getting. Is I think some of the other TRT clinics have set that precedent, unfortunately. So, I wouldn't. I don't even like to call us a TRT clinic. We are a human optimization, not even a clinic. We're just a human optimization like program or platform or service, you know. Um, so yeah, to to kind of answer that, what would happen is basically, you know, you get first and foremost, if you wanted, you could just take control of your health and order your own labs if you knew what to look for, which is pretty cool. I think um, that's something that uh, even today I was just kind of I was watching uh, Peter Atia. I'm not sure if you're familiar yeah, with him. Absolutely, yeah. super interesting guy. He did a, a video on uh, lipoprotein little a, which is a, a cholesterol marker. Somebody commented and they're like, I can't get my doctor to order this, and and then I comment like, Go to Merrick Health, dude. Like you can order whatever you <laughs> mm-hmm. want, you know, because. So, but uh, that's that could be the first step. You could just order labs and take I've a peek I've had friends who've had trouble getting certain things ordered, yeah, yeah. in the past. Yeah, it sucks. Um, so we give you that power if you want, if you have a distrust in healthcare professionals or something, which is common these days, and I understand why, then maybe if you want, just take it into your own hands and look at it. Um, but the kind of more traditional route is we would set you up with what's called a patient care coordinator. Um, they're basically, I like, I like to consider them like your concierge, where they are your go-to for all things your optimization. Um, So they're going to help you to order the appropriate labs. Um, That may be like uh, you have a lab panel with us that kind of has things that you think will be geared to your listeners. Um, So they can set you up with a lab panel that they think are going to help to look into your symptoms and things. After that, they'll get them back and and the patient care coordinator will do a really thorough um, kind of review of the labs with you. If there's things on there that they can recommend, like, hey, it looks like you're uh, you're a little B vitamin deficient. Let's get you set on some some B vitamin. They can give you those recommendations. Um, they can give you like they'll help a lot with lifestyle stuff. Sometimes like, it's just supplements, even yeah, like over the counter supplements, right? Yeah. yeah, a lot of times it can be. Um, it can even just be lifestyle things. Like hey, you said, you on your intake, you're only sleeping four hours a night. You know, let's try to let's try to fix that. We get that going, or mm-hmm. you know, you you haven't been eating quite right. Let's set you up with the right kind of a diet. Um, so that's the thing that the patient care coordinator is doing with you. The last step would be if if there's anything on there that actually requires medical attention, they'll set you up with a, a physician that's targeted to kind of your goals. So. We have uh, we have people like myself who you know have done like bodybuilding, CrossFit, um, powerlifting, and dabbled in the performance enhancing myself. And so maybe you're somebody who's running steroids already, and you want a doctor who understands that to help you with like harm reduction. Maybe you get teamed up with somebody like me. There's other docs who are specialists. And that's like, a good thing to point out. A lot yeah. of times, if you go to a regular doctor, they're not gonna. Yeah. Maybe understand that you you know you enjoy taking performance enhancing drugs to be a little bit bigger than yeah. the average person. Exactly. It's my and hobby. They might not understand <laughs> your your levels and stuff like yeah. that. Yeah, my hobby to be jacked. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's a huge thing too. Like I, I feel like they a lot of times people are afraid to bring that stuff up. They feel like they're going to get judged. Like come to us, please. Like. I might not be able to give you trend, but I know what trend is. Does your primary care? Probably not. They've it's not approved for human use. They probably have never even heard the word trend. <laughs> you know? So like I can help you to set up these risk mitigation strategies and stuff that can help. Like I can't condone it. I'll tell you you shouldn't be doing this, but if you are, let's do all these other things too. Let me give you the like ancillaries to help your health, you know. 
So uh, that's one thing that we can get. But with your guys still going back to him, you know, if then he progresses to to the doc, then we take a look at different things. And it may not always be testosterone. With you, with your guy, maybe that you're, you're theoretical there. Maybe he has a pretty decent testosterone, but we notice that his A1C is uh, in diabetic territory. His fasting insulin super high. He's insulin resistant. That's where all of symptoms are coming from. Then we can address that. So we address that with various lifestyle intervention. First and foremost, we recommend different... Uh, uh, training protocols and diets and things. And then if we need to pro, uh, progress to pharmaceuticals, we will. But I would say that on the, the list of what we do, the pharmaceutical is very small. It's mm -hmm. all of that other, the stuff that patient care coordinators talk to you about, all that lifestyle stuff. We even recommend readings to patients, you know, like actual books to read and mm -hmm. things. Like we are very holistic in it. The medication, like if you, I kind of alluded to earlier, if you want to just come for the drugs, like we're probably not the clinic for you, you mm -hmm. know? We're definitely all about optimization. Um, a lot of guys come through here and don't even get things. And, you know, sometimes that'll piss the kid off. They're like, I paid all this money and I only got recommended to take supplements. And sorry, man, we're, we care about your health. Like, yeah. you know, there's other places. There's there's underground labs that'll hook you right up. There's And unfortunately now there's a TRT clinics where you can get that stuff, but that's not us, you know. And I'm happy you clarified a lot of that because when a lot of people think about Merrick Health, they think it's a TRT clinic. They yeah. think I'm going to come to Merrick and I'm going to get my, some tests and some drugs. And you guys... First off, in terms of medications, you guys have a ton of different medications for different yeah. things. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I, I always say, like, we are not a TRT clinic. Like, we look at hormones. That's one. That's, you know, we look at testosterone, free testosterone. That's one test out of, like, the 35 I mentioned earlier. That's a very small amount of, you know, what we do. Mm -hmm. Like, we take a look at your entire body. So, yeah, we're going to talk to you about your insulin sensitivity, your your lipids, you know, your cardiac health, your metabolic health. We're going to talk about all of that. So don't expect to come and only focus on your testosterone because we're definitely going to be focused on your entire health. Uh, just in my own experience, um, this makes uh, conversations in the household a lot easier. Does it? You know, when you're not, when you're like... Uh, Hey, you know, I got to go meet up with Greg in the fucking parking lot to get a bunch, <laughs> score a bunch of tests and trend. <laughs> That's some shady shit going on that the wife's not going to be too too happy about, I, or or the uh, the rest of the, the rest of the family. And who the I fuck, have had a very similar experience. So. Who knows what situation you can get yourself yeah. into with that? This is this is something where you can go to your significant other, say, you know how into this shit I am. Like I, I you know, I love training, you know, and I, I want to try to take it to the next level. Yeah, and it's it's more. Um, you have a you have healthcare professionals by your side, uh, watching your cholesterol, your blood pressure, all these other markers That's of health. True. Right? Did yeah. you did you say meet Greg in a park parking lot for test and trend? Yeah, was that the oh. same guy you went to? I mean, but I mean <laughs> how, how long you ago go to was Greg it? too? Was, was his last name? Did you do that? Yeah, was this <laughs> oh, <the name>? yeah. <laughs> Coach Greg? Thank you, appreciate it. I mean, I, I wouldn't. The timeline might matches a, up. Might have been a while ago. <laughs> That's fun. I didn't even. Yeah, I've I've had that same thing though. Like it's so much easier now. You know, I'll, I'll tell the fiance like I've got to go do a shot. It's so nice to be like I'm gonna. Before, when we first moved in together, so the she was just like, something smells. And so I had this this testosterone suspension, which is uh, like, that's, as you know, like it doesn't have an ester, it's just raw testosterone. But in order to make mm, that, rough you have shot, to- Rough shot, rough shot. Yeah, you have the the things that they cut it with, the, the, something called guayacol, I think it's mm. literally like paint thinner. And so the entire <laughs> house is just smelling like paint thinner. When you inject it, your pores are reeking of it. And she's like, something smells like <laughs> awful. What is this? I'm like, I don't know. I have no <laughs> idea. What, that's so weird. It's my and hormones. So, <laughs> yeah. So then one day, like, I, like I'm at work and she's like smelling around. Like I'm getting to get to the bottom of this, you know, and finds the bag and like sends me a picture. Like the fuck is this? You know, I'm like, <laughs> oh yeah. So like, someone got to talk about that. Yeah. Oh yeah, I forgot about that. <laughs> well, and who knows what weird bunk you but, know yeah, gear no, you get and that's the shots awful you take and to how... like to use something like that, like to put that into your body. Like uh -huh. I'm, I'm not happy about the, the fact that it. Did that. <laughs> but I mean, that is kind of the cool part about Merrick is you know I'm being open about this shit. You know, this yeah. is the things that when you come to us, like you are, we're not gonna. I'm not gonna look down at you if you tell me like, hey, I'm getting ready for a show right now and I'm running you know 500 megs a trend a week and I and that's. I don't agree with it. I don't think you should, but I, I've been there and I can help you and I can guide you down the right path to, to do some harm uh, mitigation. Mm -hmm. um, so that's kind of cool, in my opinion. I think what, what are the negative side effects, if there are any, of uh, taking like TRT dosages and maybe even high, a little higher to the performance enhancing side? Um, 
that that you've seen it, it does it automatically uh, cause elevations in like our blood lipids and blood pressure and things like that? So actually, just a, a few days ago, a pretty landmark study came out. It was a really uh, big meta analysis that showed. Um, that uh, taking testosterone wasn't linked, at least in the short and midterm uh, time ranges, linked to cardio in increase in cardiovascular disease, which is huge for like TRT. Um, because before it's always kind of been a lot of people have just kind of been talking out their ass and said like, you know, even being on TRT is going to negatively impact your cardiovascular Was this uh, kind of specific to like a just like just testosterone? Yeah, I, th okay. I believe so. Yeah, just just That's actual important TRT. to note because sometimes people are taking a bunch of other things. Right. And Makes and it hard. To in my opinion, that's not true, like TRT or HRT. You know, when I when I think testosterone replacement therapy, mm -hmm. you know, I'm replacing testosterone. That's not see, throwing in oxandrolone and androlone and everything else. Like, we don't make those, you know. Um, so, yeah, the, the kind of things with TRT that we see is we can potentially see that there is an increase in LDL cholesterol, a decrease in HDL cholesterol, and the LDL is the quote-unquote bad, but I don't want to say that because that's, if you know, I don't think that people should say it. It's cholesterol. It mm -hmm. just, it can do things. And then the HDL is a quote unquote good, which is highly debatable too. We've, uh, in the past, we've increased HDL and it hasn't changed any markers for like overall mortality. So that's interesting is how good really is HDL. But anyways, that'll lower. Um, and then we do usually see some increase in your blood thickness. So like the amount of red blood cells or the hematocrit and hemoglobin, which to an extent can be a good thing because that's where it's going to help with performance. It's when it gets too thick that we're, you know, we're um, we're basically setting you up to have uh, elevated risk for things like clot and stuff like that. So we try to prevent. But within the when you're running a TRT dose, like that replacement dose, you usually don't see things get too crazy. When we see it is when we push too far into that super physiologic. Mm. And then I would argue, argue too that I think that we can definitely push it a little bit, you know, like so on the uh, the lab like thing that you get from LabCorp or Quest or something, it probably has like a 900 total. But we definitely see natural athletes and, and teenagers and things that run up to like, you know, 1,200, 1,300, 1,500 sometimes. So I don't think there's probably that many deleterious effects to having something like a 1,300 testosterone. That's a lot different than a 2,000, of course. I think we're probably going to run into some negative effects then. But just being able to push it a little bit to give somebody a little bit of extra edge and whether it be career or their fitness or whatever else probably isn't that bad. But I think that you should definitely be under the watchful eye of a trained physician or something mm -hmm. or a PA and P, a trained medical professional and kind of be checking those markers. Otherwise, you're just you're, you're you know, you're blind like me. Like I didn't know about the prolactin. I would have never known if I didn't get my labs drawn. You mm -hmm. know, there was actually something going on there. I have a question about that, and this is from my uneducated view of hormones. You you mentioned how, like, yeah, there are teenagers that are, have, like, 1,200, 1,500, whatever, natural test. And it makes me wonder if a person wants to come in and they, they go up to those levels with all the different factors that are involved in, in, in testosterone and gaining muscle and all, all of this stuff, would it not be far-fetched if somebody's just somebody is not set up to have that much test coursing through their body if like maybe this teenager because that's what they're able to produce they work well producing that maybe what i'm saying is stupid but should some people maybe not have it that high are there problems with certain people yeah not having it that i think that, i think that's a, a fair argument to make um especially like kind of like i said before sometimes uh I, you know, I've seen really awesome athletes come in with like a 400 testosterone, which yeah. most guys would probably consider low. Mm -hmm. But I'm like, this guy looks, he's jacked. He looks amazing. Like maybe he has other, and there's other things going on, you know, the androgen receptors, the, the transcription, like I talked about so many other things going on. Maybe they don't need that much. And then maybe there's an argument to be made that they will be, have, uh, they can ramp up the negative side effects too, you know, if they run those numbers too high. Maybe yeah. they're, they don't require that, and so it just becomes more of, uh, like, deleterious than actual <clears throat> beneficial. So uh, to add on to that, and this is another question, that because I, I know athletes that have low testosterone, but they're elite athletes, and they're the way they go about life, they're not like, oh, 400 yeah. tests, I'm tired all the time. They're vibrant individuals. Yeah. So for them, and this is, again, a hypothetical, I don't know if there's even an answer to this, is getting them to 800 and 900, will that be, you know, people think that if I'm at 400 and then I'm at 900, I'm automatically going to be a higher performing athlete. Is that something that's like just true? Like if you have higher test, you will, will perform better and life will be better? So I I think that uh, I think that if it's natural testosterone, like a natural 400 versus a natural 800, 
probably not much difference. I would argue though, probably that you get some benefit if you are a uh, an enhanced like 800, because the difference there is that we are keeping a steady level of 800 at all times. Mm -hmm. And so a natural person may go down to like 400 and they'll peak up to 800 and they'll have these peaks and valleys. And so I do think that the person on TRT is gonna have a bit more edge. Like uh, a TRT 800 has a bit more edge on a natural 800, wow. just due to that. Okay, But, at the same time, like how much? Probably pretty negligible. And mm -hmm. I think like you talked about the athlete, all the other stuff they're doing in their life is the huge driving factor. You know, like I, I worked out here last night, I forget the kid's name, Smokey, uh, he, the young kid in here, like 19 or 20. Kenny? Uh, yeah, mm. the dude's <laughs> jacked, right? Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, he's, and from- Looks incredible, yeah. Yeah, and uh, and you know, Smokey was like, yeah, he's not doing anything. And I am I believe it, you know, he's freaking putting in hard work. And then I like, cause I saw him working out, his shirt is drenched, like he's training amazingly. He's And then after, first thing he does, he goes and gets his meal prepped food and he's <laughs> eating it. I'm like, yeah, he's getting the results because he's doing all the other work. Like you can't expect to just pin something and everything is gonna happen. Cause there's people that massively use the shit out of this stuff and they don't look that great, you know? Mm -hmm. Like when you look at the pros and the elite level power lifters, the elite bodybuilders, like everything else is dialed in. You know, like I I went through a stint where I tried some bodybuilding for like a year. I've never been so miserable. It was so hard to get down that food, mm. just the food alone. You know, mm -hmm. like I was getting to the point where I was eating whatever sugary cereal I could get my hands on just to get those calories and it tasted disgusting to me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like I was eating boxes of mac and cheese and a oh, pound oh, of meat. Oh. like doing everything that I could to get the calories in. Mm. And it wasn't fun. Mm -hmm. Like it's awful. And they're doing that, but they're eating fish and uh, like chicken and rice, fish and rice, beef and, beef and rice every day, day in and day out, you know, mm. like it's hard. And I mean, you know, you, you were at that level. Like yeah. it was all that, like, I don't think the drugs got you to where you were. It was everything else that you did. That was the cherry on top. You know, that was the supplement. But uh, like it didn't replace all the hard work you put in. It may have. I took a lot of shit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I want to go back to uh, you talking about like uh, the health side of things and and taking uh, a TRT dose and maybe even slightly a little bit higher. I think that maybe there's some people out there that are under the uh, impression that steroids are going to add like twenty to thirty pounds to their frame, and it sometimes it can. If somebody's really getting after it, if somebody's really training really hard, they got all their meals intact, uh, it might yield that much weight gain, depending on how much the person weighs, because it's probably going to represent an overall percentage of your body weight that you're going to be able to gain. Um, in my own experience, you know, I recall gaining probably about 15 pounds fa fairly quickly. I mean, in comparison to like the years it takes to put on 15 pounds of muscle. Uh, when you first start training, uh, maybe you could say it might only took you a year, two years to gain 15. But once that yeah. once that year of hard work started, those put newbie in, gains, yeah, you don't you don't get that you don't get a second or third uh, burst of that unless yeah. you take something. But I, I like to point this out because it's not going to turn you into being so much bigger to the point where you're going to have a lot of health concerns. Yeah. Now again, if you go off the rails and you take your own dosages and you start taking a lot of stuff and you start to bring in other factors, then your blood pressure is going to go through yeah. the roof. Uh, then your red blood cell count is going to be high. Now you have high blood pressure. Uh, your um, resting heart rate is probably not good. It's probably jacked. So your heart rate's going pretty fast all the time. You have thick blood that's trying to be pushed around in a body that has high blood pressure. Yeah. And I believe that that's where a lot of these uh, recent deaths have happened with bodybuilders. It's not necessarily just the stuff that they're taking, but it's the fact that they, the combination of all the things that they took yeah. uh, made them so large. And then also they're taking uh, clenbuterol and things like that that kind of speed up your heart rate, pre-workout um, type stuff, caffeine and all these other things. Meanwhile, their blood pressure is really high because they're 60 or 70 pounds heavier than normal. Yeah than what their normal body weight would be. And they're literally like an obese person, just muscle, which yeah. is actually more metabolically active, has more vascularity, so puts more strain on the heart than even fat would, so yeah. Right, and, and <laughs> uh, you, anything is possible, so I don't like to say that something's impossible, but it would be near impossible for you to gain that amount of size uh, with like a TRT dosage or, right. I mean, you're, you're pointing out like testosterone replacement. Yes. Like you might only notice a five or six pound, yeah. which is huge. 
you might gain five pounds of muscle. You might lose two or three pounds of fat because your metabolism might be increased because you now have a little bit more muscle mass. Yeah. That'll look really awesome on a lot of people. Just yeah. that small, that small little manipulation. But you're, in my opinion, you wouldn't be putting yourself at any risk in terms of health concerns. It's only when you go in into the astronomical amounts and you're really pushing and you're trying to gain a tremendous amount of body weight. Yeah, I would agree. Um, there are for for some reason it's interesting because it, it does seem that when we dose with exogenous testosterone, we do ramp up that blood cell production a little bit more than just natural testosterone would. And I don't know if that's really ever been studied as to why. I know that it does promote the erythropiosis, it's a hard word to say, uh, the creation of new red blood cells. The EPO. Yeah, yeah. Um, So uh, it it ramps that up a bit, but why it does more than uh, like endogenous or our natural testosterone is interesting. I don't know why the the difference is, but it does seem to. So you can run into that. But like that study showed, it likely isn't going to increase cardiovascular disease. You know, Mm -hmm. you're right. It's everything else. It's it's the massive like they're pushing down on that hammer as far as how many androgens are running and all the other compounds. So their body's under this massive amount of oxidative stress. The workouts too, like training the way that a lot of these guys do isn't really the healthiest, you know, either like getting under like the, what you mm-hmm. did probably really wasn't that healthy for Might you. Might not have been a good idea. Yeah. <laughs> and when you're looking at longevity, now right. did you have fun and stuff? Yeah, right. that's a different story. Um, but yeah, that's probably not great. And then, then just walking around with all that mass and everything too, yeah. Mm-hmm. And then a lot of times, unfortunately, like big in the 90s and things, you know, guys got really hooked onto other drugs and things, you know, they mm-hmm. were doing all the, the open opiates and stuff just to be able to get through the training. So there were so many other confounding factors. But yeah, the TRT, it literally is a replacement. You know, I, I explained it as like vitamin D is a hormone too. When you have low vitamin D, we replace that and get that back to normal. That's basically what we're doing with testosterone. We're not trying to tip the scales into the growth phase, really. We're just trying to replace it so that you get some of the, the benefits from it. And some of that is cardiovascular protect, uh, protection, actually, because it's great for the heart and stuff. Like, mm-hmm. Having too low of testosterone is just as bad as having too high of testosterone. So they kind of have that, that nice little window where things are optimized, and that's what we're aiming for. We don't want you too low. We don't want you too high. Yeah. You know, Mark's been doing a lot of running, like miles and miles a week. Crazy. And when it comes to some of these athletes who do take tests or who do take extra stuff to get bigger, do you think that it would probably be, most people think it's bad for the gains, but it would probably be a good idea to do something that would allow them to increase their cardiovascular capacity? Yeah, I absolutely. mean, you see Kai Green still fucking doing the step mill yeah. all the time. And I wonder if like a lot of these individuals who choose to do bodybuilding, whether it's uh, someone young who's just trying to gain as much muscle as possible or an IFBB person, if they really spent time each week doing cardio, but challenging cardio that yeah. actually increases their aerobic capacity, do you think that that could be something that tips the scales back to being healthy, even though it might take away from a little bit of muscle gain? Yeah, I don't. I would even argue that it might probably wouldn't even take away from gains. <laughs> um, you know, like, and I think a lot of the pros these days kind of realize that. In fact, they're using a lot of them keep cardio in in the off season first, mm-hmm. probably because they're seeing all their friends drop dead, unfortunately. And second, though, a lot of them will say it increases their hunger and helps them get more food in. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, there there's benefits to it. And I think most of the top bodybuilding pros are doing some bit of cardio in the off season right now which is good maybe some nutrient partitioning like the nutrients going to the right places yeah, rather too. than yeah. like just being stored as body fat exactly like that. yeah and then but there I, there's so many other things that have just recently started to be talked about like before it was people didn't even think about blood pressure medications or diabetes medications and things other than the insulin like post-workout but like these things are probably like I think that if you're going to venture into like the performance enhancing drugs, some of the first things you should get online is like an antihypertensive drug, like an ARB, an angiotensin II receptor blocker, mm-hmm. and probably something to help you with your glucose disposal, like a metformin or maybe a, a basal insulin like Atlantis or something. If you're going to be pushing into those, like we used to just focus on the drugs, the the bodybuilding, like the anabolic things, we left out all the other you know benefits uh, uh, that we could get out of uh, pharmaceuticals. Yeah. Yeah. And so we probably could have saved some lives if these guys would have just been on like a blood pressure medication, you know, and they would have saved their kidneys and everything else. What you got over there, Andrew? You're brewing up some questions yeah. I can see. <clears throat> yeah, no, I was curious because you had mentioned that like at Merrick, um, like the pharmaceutical stuff, that's like going to be towards the end. Like you're not going to walk, you're not going to go up to Merrick and that's the first thing you're going to get. 
But in like what case would would somebody get prescribed testosterone? Because yeah. you had just mentioned a bunch of different testosterone levels, and I'm thinking in my head like like well shit, I think mine was at a 400. You know, so like does that mean that I wouldn't get testosterone if I went, even though I had X, Y, and Z symptoms? Yeah, we've literally prescribed to guys with like a you know a double digit testosterone, and then we've prescribed to guys that even have like a 600 testosterone. Mm-hmm. So that's one nice thing is we really focus on that subjective on the individual how they feel um, because we do have guys that sometimes they they have that 600 testosterone which any normal most people would be like that's a great testosterone but they have all of the other symptoms their libido's terrible they don't have good motivation they're not making gains they're putting on fat everything else in their life is dialed in then we we take a kind of uh, outside the box approach and we're like let's try this you know and we and a lot of times that can help and what's to say like you know this guy's 50 now it's the first time he's ever had his testosterone tested what if he was one of those guys that operated his whole life at a 1200 mm-hmm. and so now he's taking a you know 100% or a 50% less than he you know mm-hmm. so yeah. Um, so we we kind of give it to basically everyone. It's very individual. We don't have an algorithm that says like, you don't get it until this number or you do mm-hmm. get it, you know, because we do give it. So, mm-hmm. Sometimes people come in 300, they feel great. Cool. It's not even talked about testosterone. Other times everything else is dialed in. I have a 900. Okay. Let's start seeing what we can do on the, te- you know. Nice. Yeah. And then, uh, so prolactin, how do we fix that? <laughs> you know, like how do we, yeah, get that back in range? Yeah. And what is it? What's it do? There you go. Yeah. So... <laughs> Prolactin uh, basically was responsible for milk letdown, which is uh, you know giving uh, making milk from the breast tissue, which uh, happens in women. Most, that's more than why like. that's happening to me. Mm. Hmm. Okay, does it taste good? Is that, we were talking about malted milk. <laughs> 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 yeah, Tony Hughes squeezed some milk out of his uh, milk out of them titties. He, he does yeah. it with, just by thinking too, right? <laughs> 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 Like focuses on it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think he he did it without even touching. Oh my god! Oh my god! Just uh, flexing it. Oh. All right. I don't. Yeah, he probably didn't even have to flex. Just like zend it out. You know, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that's that's one of the things. And more though, and, and like so in men, it's actually kind of the uh, the thing that stops us um, from like after an orgasm. We have this massive rush of dopamine and things. Something needs to calm that down because we can't just be in a perpetual state of orgasm. Aww, <laughs> no, I, <laughs> and, we have some drugs for yeah, that. Right. <laughs> we would get nothing done. Yes, <laughs> yeah, right. And so prolactin is kind of the your body's natural like shut off. It's you know it, it stops that and, and you know that's why if your prolactin is too high, mm-hmm. the refractory period or the time between ejaculation can be very large, very increased. So lowering that, you could get some benefit. It, you know, more mm-hmm. than one round. Um, so that, that's kind of what it does. And then ways to lower it. So um, the way that we like to usually start is with vitamin B6, the uh, active form of that, something called P5P, taking it like 50 to 100 milligrams before bed because it can help with sleep too, has been shown to reduce mm-hmm. that prolactin pretty significantly, which is nice. Um, there are some people that require more um, heavy duty pharmacologic drugs like cabergoline or bromocryptine. These can be like they have a host of uh, bad side effects. So that's one thing I don't recommend guys just jumping on, which is pretty common in the bodybuilding world. You get on trend or something, you get a little sore nipples. People are just popping caber, which is crazy because that has like a, I think there's, I think it's like a 300 milligrams lifetime exposure before you run into like cardiotoxicity, which is a very small amount. Wow. So when we're prescribing it, it's like 0.25, like once to twice a week. And I shouldn't even be talking doses here because somebody's going to be. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. <laughs> but, you can allegedly, that yeah. allegedly, that's the dose. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I mean, that's a, at least it's a much safer. But uh, then, like, I remember reading on the bodybuilding.com forums, like, you know, Papa Graham and every other day or something. It's like, oh my God. Dudes just terrible. love saying Papa Graham. Yeah. Like, <laughs> that's, that's just like baseline now. Yeah. yeah. But th- there are some agents that we may need to deploy if you have, some people have what's uh, basically like a, a small tumor on the pituitary that's causing excess uh, secretion of this. Wow. It's actually pretty common. We diagnose it pretty often, which is not interesting because. We'll see guys coming in with all the signs of having low T, like their libido's down and, you know, they're feeling like crap and all this and and their doctors tested their testosterone. It's fine. They come to us. We look at prolactin for the first time, mm-hmm. massively elevated. We tell them to go get an MRI and they have the, uh, this small tumor on the pituitary and that's cool because somebody finally diagnosed it. A lot of times the the doctors out, the, you know, your primary care and things aren't thinking about stuff like this, unfortunately. Hmm. Yeah. yeah, On the prolactin side, um, I was wondering, what are the lifestyle things that people do that could be causing elevated prolactin? Like what, like, you know, 
I've heard that Kratom does that, and yeah. that's what I saw in my last test with Merrick. But do things like weed, or yeah. are there things like Those habits two. that people have? Kratom and marijuana. Kratom yeah. and marijuana. Yeah. Okay. So maybe watching too much porn, you know? Okay. Constantly. Well, I, mean, I guess it doesn't even need to be porn, but constantly, you know, doing things to yourself. <laughs> not, not, not all day long. Yeah. That makes Actually, that, sense. that's like something I, I've thought about too. Like sometimes I'm like, with somebody has a high one, and, and I'm like, you use Kratom? No. Marijuana? No. Like, hmm. Did you rub one out before you got these labs? Like, <laughs> I don't ever say it, but I'm like, maybe that's what it was. We'll we'll check next time and see yeah. if it's still elevated. <laughs> yeah. mm. But it's possible. And theoretically, right? Yes. Yeah. Power Project Family, how's it going now? We partnered with Bubs Naturals and they're an amazing brand. They have this just wonderful MCT oil powder that I put on my coffee in the morning. And they have this collagen protein. Most people don't get the amount of collagen that they need in. All mix well in anything, coffee, water, whatever. It's also Whole30 approved. But the thing I want to talk to you guys about real quick <laughs> are these apple cider vinegar gummies. Now, if you go on Google and you type in apple cider vinegar, there's tons of benefits. Immune support. Uh, digestive. Metabolism, digestive. Mm -hmm. Digestion. Can, oof. Mm -hmm. uh, but one thing you'll also come across is apple cider vinegar tastes like shit. It's bad. It's really bad. Uh, that's why they came out with these crack gummies. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the reason why I call them crack gummies, and it's an empty, uh, empty little package of them, mm -hmm. because uh, we can't not eat a lot of them at once. They're really good for you. <laughs> don't get me wrong, but they also taste really good. And it's hard to only eat two at once, and the serving mm -hmm. size is two. So you guys should get this. You should only have two. Uh, <laughs> good luck. <laughs> good luck. But the benefits of apple cider vinegar actually from these gummies, I noticed that my, honestly, it, it's helped my digestion a lot. So. A ton. Yeah. Yeah, it definitely has helped me, uh, you know, hit, hit the bathroom a lot more consistently. Uh, Mark always talks about, you know, may your shits be tapered. And I guarantee you with those, they will be. <laughs> they will uh, be. But just, yeah, please don't eat the entire bottle the way we do. But they're they're that good. And, you know, I have tried apple cider vinegar and all that stuff. And I just, it made, me, it made me sick. I, I just, I felt real bloated. And I couldn't be consistent with it with this. It's very easy to stay con consistent. We're too consistent. <laughs> a little bit too consistent. Yeah. But uh, head over to bubsnaturals.com and make sure you guys enter promo code POWERPROJECT to save 20% off your entire order. Again, bubsnaturals.com, uh, pro promo code POWERPROJECT to save 20% off. Links to them down in the description as well as the podcast show notes. What about, um, what, what hormones should we be? should we be paying attention to if we're, um, if our goal is fat loss? Like what should we keep in check? Yeah, so I mean, testosterone would be a big one there. Um, that's something that you, especially if you want to maintain some muscle mass, is probably going to benefit you in its anti-catabolic properties. Um, definitely, we should be looking at things like your insulin sensitivity. Um, so we check your fasting insulin, which is something that a lot of doctors don't do too, which is interesting to see. And we take really aggressive approaches in all these. Um, I think the marker goes up to like 25 or something on insulin. We like to see that number below five. So like we want you to be very insulin sensitive. Mm -hmm. um, so that's something to look at. Your hemoglobin A1C, which is a measure of basically how much uh, blood glucose has been in your system for the past you know, three months, basically kind of makes a stain on the red blood cells so we can, we can get a, a view of how elevated your sugars have been. So that's one of them. Um, those are the big ones. And just see if you're metabolically healthy, you know. Got it. And then before we got on air, you guys were talking about a, like a fat loss drug. Uh, what was that called? I think we were talking about semaglutide a bit. Which helps with hunger, right? Yeah. So it's interesting. Uh, semaglutide was um, originally made for diabetes, type 2 diabetes. It works on the uh, the pancreas at the level of the beta cells, which secrete the insulin. So we're trying to um, basically ramp up uh, insulin secretion. And because of what happens a lot of times in these type 2 di diabetics is if they're uh, They've been secreting too much insulin. They become insulin resistant. So mm -hmm. they're, the insulin isn't working at the cells. The pancreas works so hard to pump it out that these beta cells basically like die out. They just get overworked. And so the, the target of the drug was to kind of heal those and promote insulin secretion. But interestingly, they found that uh, a lot of these test subjects, which were obese people with diabetes, were losing a significant amount of weight. And then it was then approved for weight loss as well in that regard. So it basically knocks out your hunger and makes it a lot easier to get into that caloric deficit. Mm -hmm. I like it a lot. I prefer that for patients because in the past, most of our weight loss medications have been like stimulants. Now they're basically like amphetamines. And 
then you're just ramping up their like you know their, their nervous system, putting them in a crazy sympathetic overdrive, and they're sw- twitching <laughs> and everything, and that sucks. I would much rather somebody just be able to get into a caloric deficit and do it a lot healthier. Mm-hmm. And then there's some people too that kind of obsess about that caloric deficit. What's nice about this is it's kind of just in the background. I tell them, don't even think about it. Quit tracking. You know, just live your life. Eat when you're hungry. When you get that urge, stop when you're full, and that mm-hmm. can be really beneficial for people. And sim- that semaglutide does that. Yeah, semaglutide. There are all the there's uh, other ones too. We like semaglutide. That's been a- shown to be um, kind of the the most superior in mm-hmm. those the GLP one agonists. What they are. Um, yeah, the, the semaglutide is the one that we tend to see the best results with. Is there particular side effects making nauseous or something very, like that? Yeah, mm. very nauseous. That's the thing. It's a once weekly injection. That's a great way to not eat. Just feel sick. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, that's like uh, yeah. There's other medications too, like you know, like uh, melanotan. You know, mm-hmm. that, that one makes you pretty nauseous, and hmm. it's been linked to like weight loss. And like, is it just because they don't feel good? <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> um, but yeah, the the. Uh, it does. It can make you nauseous. So sometimes we'll give it alongside like Zofran, which is an anti uh, like nausea medication. Um, but that's one of the side effects. And then two, if you've had a history of like a um, thyroid cancer, or it's in your family or something, that's something to look into. I don't think it's actually ever been shown in humans, but in animal models, it has been shown to potentially be linked to a thyroid cancer. And so that's something we uh, you know need to look into in your history and things and start. So mm. yeah, that would. Those are the two. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm wonder, because on the podcast, we talk a lot about just habits needed to be healthy, whether you're trying to lose fat, gain muscle, or just live a healthy lifestyle. Now with, you know, the amount of people that you've seen come to try to get uh, human optimization in any way, uh, you guys do the long questionnaire where you figure out what their lifestyle is like. Do you notice, do a majority of people have like bad lifestyle habits and they're trying to replace those lifestyle habits with something pharmaceutical because i wonder like you know we use caffeine and there have been times in the past years ago when like i just drank a lot of coffee because i wasn't getting enough sleep and if i just got enough sleep i wouldn't need to drink as much coffee and everything else would be better so how often do you see that do you think it's a majority or do you think it's a minority of people I think in general, it's probably the majority do that. Mm-hmm. Our client base, though, I, I actually really like like the guy. I mean, we're teamed up with people like you and you know other very like minded. So the people coming to us are pretty like, you know, fitness forward and health yeah. forward. So we we have a pretty cool population we work with, and I mm-hmm. love the patients we work with. Um, but more often than not, like outside of Merrick that I've seen, yeah, people just want like you know the pill and the pharmaceutical to help with everything. Um, you know, that's something that I talk about too, like, cause you know, by training, I am like a foot and ankle doc and I, I do a lot with that and athletes, but I, I always tell people like, I can't just prescribe, like, you know, go barefoot and do all these foot exercises cause people aren't going to do it. That's why we use the crutch of the orthotic and stuff. Mm-hmm. You know, these are people that I can't even talk into doing a 10 minute walk a day. How am I going to tell them like, get out the toe spacers and the ball and like do like two hours of warming up your feet every day and exercising and, and uh, you know, strengthen all these intrinsic muscles. Like it just doesn't work. These people don't want to make those lifestyle changes. Yeah. Um, so yeah, but at Merrick, you know, we do see more of the people who are really dialed in and they want an extra, you know, I always say it's where that last like 5%, you know, they got 90, 95% of it dialed in. Mm-hmm. We can help. Sometimes we are, we investigate and we find that sleep. Other times it's medication, mm-hmm. but it, we help with everything in between, you know. Are there any drugs or hormones that can help with uh, people getting better sleep and there's not like a negative side effect to it? That's hard, man. Sleep's the, wor- the hardest thing for me. I'm like, I, I wish, as you know, it's, right. it's tough. There's so many variables to it. Um, recently, there's been something called uh, Delta sleep inducing peptide. The research that I've seen isn't too promising on it. And so I don't even usually recommend it. For some people who maybe want to try it, we will, uh, you know, facilitate that with them. I personally like melatonin a lot. Everybody mm. knows about melatonin, but I kind of, I mega dose melatonin in myself for its antioxidant yeah, I don't know if you saw Dante Trudell talking about that. Yeah. Well, He's talking he was, about taking like 200 milligrams. So I take 40. So, so yeah, it's served yeah. in a four milligram thing. And he's like, people have had it all wrong. You need to take like this crazy <laughs> yeah well i think for like crazy amount. sleep the dose is really small like only up to like three grams but if you want it for all the antioxidant properties right. and i think he was talking about fat loss potentially too um it's interesting it has these anti-cancer properties as well the cool part about melatonin is a potent antioxidant and that like 
each of its metabolites that it's metabolized into is an antioxidant as well. So normally you have like an antioxidant and then it's metabolized into other things, but each one of these metabolites is another antioxidant that can be beneficial. So it has these layers of uh, properties that can help with our, you know, mm -hmm. reducing oxidative burden. It seems cool. to work with in collaboration with vitamin D or something like that too, yeah. right? Yeah. Or is it, is it, is it a hormone, melatonin? Well, yep, it is. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, the thing with melatonin though, is it, I don't think it really helps people stay asleep. It's more of, it kind of sets the stage to fall asleep. You know, we're mm -hmm. naturally producing it when the lights go down, you know, we would have, um, so it's not something that's keeping you asleep. So that can be an issue. And a lot of people's problem isn't falling asleep, it's staying asleep. Mm. Um, my, the biggest thing for sleep for me is lifestyle, the sleep hygiene we all talk about. You know, we'll, we'll be coaching people on get some sunlight first thing in the morning, mm -hmm. and, you know, turn off the, don't be exposed to blue lights and things before going to bed. The lifestyle surrounding sleep is the biggest. Unfortunately, the infrastructure we all live in is very uh, like deleterious to sleep hygiene. I have Do a you question. Use, uh, mouth tape? I don't, but I, I don't think I, I, I personally am pretty good on sleep now. I've kind of got mm. it dialed in. Oh, good. Yeah, luckily. I mean, I go to bed at like eight and wake up at three. I'm mm. kind of crazy. Mm. I got to work out super early. Wow. Um, but yeah, I don't, but I think it could be, could be beneficial. Yeah. When it comes to melatonin, you're mentioning like the infrastructure when it comes to getting ready for sleep is messed up. Like we do live in houses that have all these lights, supermarkets. Do you think, and I'm curious, when you take melatonin, you said it helps you fall asleep. Do you take it because of the infrastructure? Like what would happen if now you stopped taking melatonin? Yeah. Because I've, I've heard, and I could be totally fucking wrong, but when people use melatonin too much, it becomes something that they then become dependent yeah. on, like caffeine. You now need coffee. Right. I need fucking coffee yeah. every morning. Is melatonin somewhat is. similar? Yeah. It's a, I mean, we are replacing a hormone. And so we, just like we talked about with testosterone, you start taking testosterone from an outside source. The body is very efficient, and it's like we're getting it from somewhere. We don't need to make it. Mm. So, a very similar thing happens in melatonin. I do, like, I, I know Huberman and stuff recommends against melatonin for that reason. Mm -hmm. I'm not taking it for the sleep, though. I am taking it for all the you know, antioxidant properties. And so, at this point, I'm basically doing melatonin replacement therapy. You know, I do okay. often think about though, like if shit hits the fan and I have to live off the land, like I'm screwed, man. No <laughs> testosterone, no melatonin, yeah. no, no caffeine. <laughs> but in, in your opinion, the antioxidant accident benefits of melatonin outweigh you not producing your own melatonin. Because I'm because I'm ramping it up to such an extreme. To, yeah. yeah. So I, I the 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 small amount that my body would produce. It, it is, it does have antioxidant properties too, mm -hmm. but I'm like pushing that, you know, I'm, I'm really hitting hard on that, that, that melatonin antioxidant thing more so than my body would produce. Last thing I want to ask on this, do you think there are any long-term ramifications to doing that? I don't know. I don't think we know. We don't know yeah, that? Maybe, well, maybe Huberman would have, be able to school me on that a bit, but because I have heard him talk against melatonin a lot, and he's a much better uh, source for all that neurochemistry than I am. Okay. Um, but I'd be interested to have that conversation. It's weird yeah. where our beliefs are, though, because he doesn't agree with that, but then he was talking about stuff that uh, boosts your testosterone. Yeah. Yeah, I know it boosts your natural testosterone, so maybe there's you know, some different things. But I think that. he's on TRT himself too. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So it's interesting kind of where our, our beliefs uh, lie right. and the different information that we have. I think sometimes the current information that we have is just we're just doing the best we can with it, and it's hard to – it's hard, kind of hard to sift through and, and – I guess find like what's the man there's so many things out there like, what's the most optimal thing yeah. you know like all the there's I'm kind of in the I, I don't like any of the extremes you know even like I'm not crazy all barefoot I'm not crazy all shoe I'm not crazy like all meat I'm not crazy all vegetable like mm -hmm. I really think most people could benefit from just kind of being in, in the middle, you know, and getting benefits from a little bit of everything. Yeah. I kind of see like the fitness industry is so polarized now and all, you know, it reminds me a lot of politics, you know, like yeah. on one side, you got the crazy, like grab them by the pussy, and, like no abortions <laughs> ever. And then on the other side, it's like, everybody should just be whatever gender they want and everybody gets aborted. And Fuck babies. <laughs> where most of us are probably right in the middle somewhere. Like, and we'd all be a lot better off if we were somewhere in the middle. That's probably how it would be with all the fitness stuff too. Like, mm. Should should people mm. eat vegetables? Probably. Do they need to eat nothing but vegetables? No. Like, and then should people could people eat organ meat? Yeah. Is that all they need to eat? Probably not. You mm -hmm. know, like let's get out of this crazy it's polarized view. It's wild that there's studies done to like disprove that stretching, you know, works or doesn't work, <laughs> yeah. or that there's uh, 
with cardio. Like there's like people that are like cardio, it pulls muscle off the body. It's like, <laughs> why are we discouraging people from moving more? Yeah. Like, let's just encourage well, them to move. A lot of times too, is the, those we're seeing more of the headlines in the media. We're not seeing the actual study and people don't even realize how to, or know how to interpret the study. Right. They didn't set out trying to show that we shouldn't stretch or something, you know? <laughs> right, like, right. Yeah. And uh, so I think that we just see this headline, like, you know, eating organ meat, it's going to, you know, eating testicles will enhance your testicles. Like, no, that's, <laughs> you won't that's, know until you try. Yeah, I guess so. Huh? Mm-hmm. Yeah. But, yeah. I, I mean, I, I think that again, like it just the, we have these crazy extremes that I think most people would benefit from just getting a little, I, I do appreciate your guys' podcast for that as you get kind of everybody on, you know, mm-hmm. you get, you get all of these extremes and then you guys kind of synthesize it and you're like, like, you know, I, I heard you talking to the, uh, that barefoot guy mm-hmm. and you're like, well, <laughs> you, yeah. And you're like kind of hitting him like, well, and I, like, you know, shoes do help. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like you do run faster yeah. with yeah. shoes on. I like, and it's, it's true. You, you know? kept swerving around mm-hmm. it. But yeah. I was like, no, you run faster when you wear shoes. Yeah. So I was like, I've never really heard Mark take this big of a stance on stuff. <laughs> this has got to come <laughs> Well, it's just like if you're gonna if you're gonna punch a wall or punch a bag or something like if you had some sort of brace or something on your hand, it'd be easier yeah. to punch it harder. Like yeah. it would just would be you would be just like less inhibition. Like right. oh, this isn't gonna hurt. Or doing a deadlift with a belt on, maybe your body's like, it's this is gonna hurt less, so you can put more into it. Yeah. Yeah, that uh, sort of deal. What about uh, testosterone for women? Like, do people do women come through Merrick and then get prescribed testosterone as well? Yeah, sometimes. Mm-hmm. Um, usually, we try to stay away from hormone replacement therapy in uh, like in a woman that's premenopausal. Um, their hormones are, are so they, they fluctuate so much and things. It can be very hard, and it's probably not uh, a wise idea to start messing with them too much until they're in that uh, postmenopause time. Mm. Um, women are very tricky. Uh, we kind of we have specialists, that, <laughs> aren't they? Yeah, <laughs> in many ways, <laughs> we have uh, some uh, some docs at Merrick that specialize in hormone uh, optimization for females, which is great. Um, but yeah, sometimes we do. Oftentimes, the testosterone is more for like the libido for them that we're seeing. Mm-hmm. Um, we'll optimize their progesterone and their estrogen, which is pretty standard, and they'll still have some issues with like libido, and that's when we'll employ a little bit of testosterone for to increase the libido. Um, that's kind of a debated subject in the endocrinology world as to whether or not it's beneficial, but that is when it's used even in standard endocrinology is more for libido than anything else. Mm-hmm. And well, then like the side effect, not side effects, but like benefits could also be the same, like m- muscle growth, uh, fat loss and that sort of thing in women. Yeah. But again, we're doing a replacement and so we're replacing that their dosage too, you know, so in a man, maybe that that replacement is only like a hundred milligrams and a female, maybe it's like five or 10 milligrams. And so they're likely just going to be back to where they normally would be physiologically. We're not going to put them into that virilization or the masculinization uh, realm, you know. So it's not like they're going to be, um, you know, growing a beard and then mm-hmm. large clit and all of that mm-hmm. stuff that you see with like the the abuse. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, easier to find. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the thing is, is we we send it to these people, and how much you <clears throat> use is up to you, you know. And, yeah. So. And what's the detriment of taking it pre-menopausal? So, yeah, I mean, you could just mess up your normal hormonal production, you know, mm-hmm. very similar to like men. Uh, and when, like I said, the body is very great at regulating these things. And so we can have some deleterious effects if we start messing around too much when it's not needed to. Mm-hmm. A yeah. fun. Oh, go ahead. But I was going to say, I wonder how that would impact uh, if they're in menopause having like a little bit of testosterone. Yeah, that- sometimes it can help to, in the in menopause is what we actually, so most people are thinking like in menopause, that's actually what we can kind of consider like post menopause, like they're in that. Um, once it's started, when they're having, we're basically giving it more for um, symptom relief. So if they're having hot flashes, they can't sleep, they're getting migraines, things like that. That's when it can be very beneficial mm. to be giving them a little bit of hormones. I know some women that have claimed that they've been in it for like 10 years. And I just look at their husband, I'm like, <laughs> What the fuck? Yeah, give them a merit card. Like, <laughs> Jesus Christ, she's taking you for a ride <laughs> over here. <laughs> she's just uh, using it to, uh, you know, act like a bee. <laughs> How did you go from uh, podiatry to hormone optimization? Yeah, it's, that's a that's interesting because that's I'm probably the only podiatrist really doing this kind of stuff. Um, yeah, so like I explained earlier before, like in podiatry, we're working with mainly patients with diabetes, type 2 diabetes, very heavily 
influenced by their lifestyle and poor choices and things, you know, or the infrastructure that they're in, a lot of different factors. But anyways, I was with a very unhealthy population. Um, I often like tell the story of when I was in residency, I, uh, because I got in this, remember, because I was into fitness and everything, I was into helping and I wanted to promote health and fitness. Um, I, I saw this patient come in, he, had, he was diagnosed with pre-diabetes and came to our clinic for a foot check. And um, I was talking to him like, this is so cool. Like I get this guy before he has diabetes, I get to talk to him and, mm-hmm. and I get to maybe make a change in this guy's life. Um, and so I give him all the recommendations, like you, know, you get this type of exercise and you know, do some heavy lifting, some resistance training, some cardiovascular, eat these type of things, keep the calories within here. Like you can reverse this. I have to tell people like, I don't like when they say like, I'm diabetic. Like, no, you're somebody who has diabetes and you can be somebody who doesn't too, because this is a preventable and a reversible disease, which mm. I don't think a lot of people realize it's reversible. Um, so I was hoping that I'm going to make this change in this guy. Uh, and then I think I see him six months or a year later and he has full blown diabetes and he has a wound on his foot. And so wounds on the feet are what we're often dealing with with diabetes and we're taking off toes and feet and legs. We're amputating because these wounds get so bad. And so, yeah, he ended up losing a toe or something. I'm like, man, this just, this sucks. This is not what I signed up to do. This is not what I'm just dealing with this bef- when it's too late. When these patients are coming in, when their bones are exposed, when there's maggots in the wound, it's, you know, this is, <laughs> this is what I'm seeing. I'm not getting to do any of the, the, the other stuff. And, and in podiatry, I could have focused more on like sports med and things, but my passion is more the optimization. Um, and so, yeah, I, I kind of met up with Merrick and loved what they were doing. We're kind of operating outside of the um, outside of the the normal. Uh, you know, we're ordering these tests that you can't from your doctor a lot of times because we're dictated by insurance or we're dictated by the infrastructure. Um, and so I loved that idea. Like I can help these people more as more as like a coach more than even a doctor. Mm-hmm. Um, and I actually so uh, I was doing a little bit of hormone replacement therapy in my own clinics too as a podiatrist because. Um, I actually had this, uh, the first time I had this wound, a recalcitrant wound, basically meaning a wound that's not healing no matter what we've done. Taking this patient to surgery, we've put on grafts, we've done offloading, we've done all these things, this wound isn't healing. So I kind of start looking into things and I find this paper uh, published, I think in 2009 out of Russia, the author's name was uh, Kelchenko. And it was uh, the employment of testosterone replacement therapy in hypogonadal men with diabetic foot ulcers. And they healed their, I think it was a N of three or so, a sample size of three, not very big, but they healed all of these ulcers with the use of testosterone. Like, this is super cool. And I'm into this stuff myself, you know. And so I, I called up the patient's endocrinologist who should be managing their hormones. And I ran the paper by them. And my thought, like, uh, oh, because I'd ordered this guy's testosterone too. He had like 100, like female level testosterone. Mm. So I'm like, yeah, he could probably benefit just like this paper showed. I asked the endocrinologist and he just dismissed me like, no, that, we're not going to do that. That's crazy. Why would you even think about that? You know, mm. like, no, we don't do Because a lot of endocrinologists don't even really do TRT. Mm. Um, and so I'm like, well, shit. So I called the primary care and I asked him and primary care is like, well, I don't do hormone placement therapy. I don't know much about it. You seem like you know what you're talking about though. Do you want to try and I will help you medically manage this patient? And I like part of my license does say that I can, uh, I can do anything systemically if it's going to aid in the in foot injuries or, or foot health. So uh, the treatment and prevention of any um, foot problems. Yeah. And so it falls within my my scope to be able to do that. But I wanted his help too because he's the one medically managing the patient. And so as a team, we employed this testosterone replacement. And within four months later, that wound was healed. So probably improved things like blood flow down there, mm-hmm. reduced inflammation. There was a lot of good benefits and it healed the wound. So I was started to routinely get testosterone labs on my patients as well. Yeah. And finding that a lot of these patients with diabetes had hypogonadism or low testosterone. And I was employing this with the help of their medical doctor overseeing it. And so then I just kind of transitioned that into to Merrick where I'm working alongside MDs and DOs too. I kind of have the personal uh, experience where I've done a lot of this stuff myself. I'm very into performance enhancing and hormones and things. And so I'm working uh, with these other docs and we're just trying to optimize before it goes down that road. And we've caught a lot of patients coming in with pre-diabetes or sometimes full-blown diabetes that they didn't know. And, you know, a lot of times their low testosterone is due to that. And what's awesome at Merrick is we can take the steps and these people are coming to us a lot, uh, you know, they have a lot more will and desire to change these things in their lifestyle. Mm -hmm. And so this patient population is awesome. I can explain to them, 
your low testosterone is due to your diabetes that you didn't know you had. Let's fix this diabetes first and foremost. A lot of times we'll see that testosterone creep back up and it changes their life just getting the diet and lifestyle in. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, it's been awesome. That, so long, long story, mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. that's fine. Oh, yeah, that's great. <laughs> I got to say, that's pretty fucking awesome mm-hmm. because, again, you, you hear about a lot of clinics who it's like somebody comes in with an issue and they're just like, just take this. Yeah. And they give the same thing. Just take this, take this, take this to everybody without actually trying to find out the underlying issues into why they are the way they are. Because right. somebody could be coming to Merrick or any clinic being like, I just want some test. But you guys will go through the blood work, go through and see you actually have this problem and you don't really need yeah. tests. Like you, you, you'll you really figure out what's wrong with people Yeah, rather than just dumping a template on them. Yeah, I would love to optimize all their other health markers first too. And we talked about there is some side effects. So somebody comes to us and their their lipids are already terrible. Like I want to fix that first because you're not really set up to be a good candidate for TRT yet. So let's optimize though. It would be it would be so irresponsible just to throw testosterone at some mm-hmm. of these people. And then why not just like fix all these lifestyle things that we can do and help them metabolically improve their insulin sensitivity, improve their lipid numbers. And then maybe if needed, which a lot of times it's not even needed at this point, but if needed, then we can employ some hormone replacement too. How can somebody mitigate uh, acne? I know sometimes that's an issue for some people when they get on yeah. testosterone, even even replacement dosages. It is. So acne is another hard one. It's kind of like sleep to me. It's kind of perplexing. Obviously, there's some type of hormone component, and that's why we're getting it through our teenage years and puberty and everything. So one of the first things that we'll try to do, or at least that I like to implement with, and some of the docs I like to work with, we'll do things like just reducing the dose a bit. Sometimes maybe you're ramping things up too high, so we cut down the dose a bit. Maybe employ more frequent injections so you're not getting massive spikes. When you bolus a, a hormone, it get, you get a large spike, and then estrogen spikes and things as well because of the aromatization. And so we try those things, reducing the dose, increasing the frequency. And then my personal kind of uh, thought on it is let's reduce as much oxidative stress and burden as we can. So getting a really good antioxidant protocol in hand. So um, first and foremost, getting your fruits and vegetables or just fruits if you want or whatever, You're getting some some good antioxidants in mm-hmm. and then uh, supplementing with those as well and things and doing more for your, your overall um, oxidative stress because sometimes I think that's what where a lot of it's coming from, especially in the guys blasting the gear and things. I think more of it is just an oxidative response to all the, the stress they're putting themselves in. Any ideas on why a carnivore diet seems to help a lot of people? I mean, so much of the testimonial from... Uh, Dr. Baker and Paul Saladino, so much of it seems to be uh, surrounding like skin. Somebody just does a carnivore diet for a week or two. It seems to be helpful in, in a lot of cases. Yeah, I don't know. I, I wish we had better like research on it. Uh, obviously, we do need to take into account anecdote. Uh, you know, people aren't lying. And I think that's a huge thing. Um, and it may be that maybe they had some allergies or something that they weren't aware of. And maybe, you know, even just, uh, with my, my fiance is a dietitian and she's very big into fruits and vegetables, balanced diet. She was probably overdoing the vegetables a bit too much and getting some like GI distress and some skin issues and things. And so she, we actually took an approach with her, like, let's cut back the vegetables a little bit. We didn't eliminate them, but, uh, we added in more fruit and replacement of the vegetables, added in a little bit more meat for her. Mm-hmm. And she did see some improvement. So everybody's a little bit different. And that's one thing I don't like, though, too, is like with the carnivore diet, that everybody needs to be eating only meat. No, probably not everybody. You know, yeah, only meat all the time. Yeah. Sounds, no. Sounds a little yeah, bit too I, much I, of a stretch. Yeah, I think it's a little bit too, but maybe some individuals benefit really well from that. I do great with all kinds of carbohydrates, and that's how I function well, you know, and, and but I don't really like having a high fat diet. It makes me feel kind of sluggish and slow mm. and I don't get any improvements cognitively. I don't do that well with fasting either. I kind of actually get brain fog when I don't eat. But some people, fasting is amazing for them. Some people, keto is amazing for them. Everybody has something that works good for them. We Mm -hmm. shouldn't dismiss it, but we also shouldn't push it on everybody. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, I think it sells to take your shirt off and to give a a crazy claim, you know, and say that you only have to eat like organs. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, that's what sells, unfortunately. It doesn't really sell to be like, it depends. You know, you're an individual. And and, try, yeah, try this. See how you feel for a while. Yeah. I wish it was more like they could say like, oh, I have seen some benefits in some people and it might work for you. And, you know. If it fits your macros, might work for you, or keto might work. And I think an interesting thing about sell. an interesting thing about meat, though, and what is undeniable is it's it's not something that people are allergic to. It's not people like people don't usually have like a bad reaction to it. However, I do agree with you. Sometimes uh, the fat 
uh, in in certain types of meat. Yeah. People are like, man, that's just they don't like it. Doesn't sit well with them. They don't yeah. digest it well. But anybody uh, that I've helped um, over the last few years, when I try to position them to eat more towards meat, it seems to help a ton. Just because other influences seem to have some sort of impact that that I can't uh, I can't tell exactly what they are. But when they kind of primarily go to meat, and I'm not saying that you should only eat meat, and I'm not saying that you should do that for like long periods of time, but I think it's a good thing to investigate. And yeah. I think if you have a problem, something like acne, I've never had acne issues, but I actually think that a lot of acne stuff is related mostly to the gut. Yeah, it's we don't of, know enough about the gut to... Is kind of what I think yeah. happens a lot of times is so much related to the food. Obviously, when you take testosterone, there's a hormone issue where the fluctuation is happening. And when I have noticed uh, issues with acne, it's been the combination of the two, hormones and food. Um, because yeah. when I did come off steroids a long time ago, um, I did notice getting some uh, acne. That one time? That one time. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing I would say, just in regards to steroids and like coming off steroids, we talked about it a little bit earlier. Um, and I don't know if you guys assist people with this or if we this do. is something that you... Uh, have come across, but my main place of concern would be somebody's uh, from from a mental perspective, yeah. where they would be mentally, uh, because especially if you're on like performance enhancing dosages for a long time, you're going to feel a particular type of way about yeah. your workouts, and it's hard not to feel a particular way about your workouts, and then feel a particular way about yourself. That's true. And then when you're on that downswing, and yeah. you don't have that energy, you don't have that strength. Uh, from a mental side of things, and even your sexual performance and even your uh, libido, like yeah. all those things are going to be coming down at the same time. Your motivation at co and career and everything. Motivation, yeah. Yeah, all that stuff is going to be zapped. So from a mental side of things, I think people should be really cautious. Yeah, me too. Uh, the mental side of things is something that we as a, a community in the fitness and performance enhancing community haven't even really ever talked about. And I think that it's been huge interest to me um, seeing the deleterious effects of a lot of these compounds that they have like long term on on our brain, so the oxidative stress alone that it, that these compounds are putting on our brain, leading to um, not only behavioral changes like we all kind of know about, but probably some long term issues too, like dementia, Alzheimer's, and things like that. Really? Yeah. Then that for some we don't talk about it enough. Uh, for the longest time, you know, we talked about hair loss and acne. Where it was like, well, steroids. I mean, like your brother's documentary. I think the quote was from that. Uh, you know, show me the bodies. What was that Romano? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And that was everybody. That was all over the forum. Show me the body. Show me the body. Well, unfortunately, now we're stepping over bodies left and right. So there's obviously an issue. Um, something's going on. Um, and so we used to only talk about, well, there's acne, there's hair loss, your blood pressure might get a little bit elevated, but when you get off, it'll go down. So no problem there. Like, I don't even consider hair loss and acne to be a, a bad side effect. Like, let's not even focus about that. Let's talk about the effect that it has on your brain, the effects it have on your heart, on your kidneys. Liver, liver is something we used to talk about a bit too. Take some, mm -hmm. some Tudka and knack and you're fine. Like liver is probably not even that big of a problem either. Like we were so focused on the wrong shit back in the day. Mm -hmm. Like when we should have been focused on the heart health, the brain health and the kidney health and all that, because that's what's taking a hit. And the brain specifically, there's been a good amount of studies showing that long-term use of these androgens and things can have some pretty deleterious effects on our brain and our cognition, and our long-term mental uh, acuity. What ages have they noticed this type of, because I, I mean, I, I've heard of, I heard Derek once talk about how like some young some young people started taking tests or whatever and it like it affected their emotions and then he kind of mentioned the brain a little yeah. bit but as far as Alzheimer's and dementia what what ages do people see some of this occurrence? Yeah, well we can, we uh, we probably don't see that until later like yeah. you know 50 60 70 and things and it's hard again it goes back to what we were talking about earlier we can't do these controlled studies where we're going to be employing these things and mm -hmm. we don't really have the the data to show what it is causing it but we can we know that some compounds produce a lot more oxidative stress and cause a lot more issues than others. We yeah. see that acutely when when mood changes and things and some people get certain ways or even some of the positive effects that we see, they are having it, they are changing brain, brain chemistry, that drive and the motivation and wanting to rip the bar off the ground, you know. That's altering brain chemistry. Yeah. Doing that long enough has got to tweak some things, you know. And there's uh, there's been at least anecdotal reports of things like the nandrolones and the trend and stuff, like altering people's like sexuality, you know. They find that when they're on cycle, they're <laughs> Their search history is getting a little strange, <laughs> you know. Like it's there. We know this is happening. Unfortunately, we can't study it to in a controlled setting where we can employ these things. Mm -hmm. But I, it's a big enough risk for me to 
I think that we should look into it and try to deploy some uh, some tactics to reduce that harm. Yeah. Yeah. On the other side of things, if you're an unmotivated person, it seems like testosterone can help a lot. Oh, yeah, absolutely. But again, that's within that replacement dosage. <laughs> right, yeah. Right. Like we're not talking about having a 3,000 total here. I mean, that's, right. yeah, it's probably going to push things a bit too far. And then some of the, the motivation and things can get a little bit too out of hand. And, mm. you know, yeah. Right. I'm seeing a lot of occurrence <laughs> of like 18s through 21, 22 year old guys hopping on some TRT. And it's uh, interesting because it's, again, replacement therapy and you're young. So what are you noticing? Because, I mean, you mentioned when you started training bodybuilding.com forums. I don't think in my age group, too, when I started training, this type of shit didn't seem to be like occurring with people my age. But now it's like it seems like, you know, there's memes of uh, guys on TRT on like TikTok and shit where they're like lifting and they're like, yeah, stay natural. Yeah. And then they're doing their shit. But <laughs> what are you noticing and what do you think young guys need to be careful with? Yeah, it's it's so, it's so different than when when we were coming up and we were doing things Because before it was like. We thought probably people, I remember even wondering if like the Olympia people were on. I'm like, I wonder if they're doing steroids. Mm -hmm. Nobody even talked about it. Now, everybody talks about it. Everybody tells their cycle. And I think that's helpful and harmful. It's helpful in that people aren't wasting money on things like muscle tech and stuff, trying thinking that, well, you know, Jay Cutler worked, he, you know, I should spend all my money because that's what he's taking. Mm -hmm. So it's helpful in that regard to where people are at least educated about what's actually happening. It's harmful in the way that every kid thinks that, like, now I got to get on. It was probably a little bit better when they thought cell tech was the thing <laughs> that was, you know, and they were just taking, spending way too much on creatine. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that, that part is like, it's hard. I like that people are well-informed. Sometimes they're too informed though. And they think that it's going to be something special. And so, yeah, we do see kids come in sometimes actually worse though than hormones because I, Hormones are these, uh, like especially testosterone, this is a bioidentical hormone. It does have deleterious effects, but probably not as much as some of like the SARMs and things that people come in doing, where these things they can order just online, you know, yeah. from research chemical places. But I swear, I'll look at some kids come in with their SARMs labs and like, you are like, you, you look like you're about to die. Your labs look so bad, you know, like the cholesterol is like, I mean, not, I'm being a little bit, uh, yeah, <laughs> but it looks awful. Their, their mm -hmm. liver enzymes are terrible. Their cholesterol is crazy. The HDL is crushed. Their testosterone's in the tank. Estrogen's non-existent. And I'm just like, man, this is awful where somebody comes in running high testosterone. We know what to expect and it's all manageable. Um, so yeah, more, it's probably worse that kids are jumping on not TRT, but more of the SARMs and things. Uh, the SARMs, I don't even think have a place for men to be using in general. Mm. I think if they're ever to be, if they're ever going to be used successfully, it'd probably be more in females. These are literally things that were made to reduce the androgenic side effects of things mm -hmm. that, you know, they, they're something that like a woman potentially or an elderly could benefit from without having to get all the side effects of masculinization and things. So the fact that like young boys even do this, I'm like, you obviously don't understand physiology and biochemistry. You have no purpose ordering a research chemical and trying this on your own. You know, it's kind of crazy. Mm. Yeah, SARMs are an interesting thing. You guys uh, go down the rabbit hole of uh, peptides as well, right? We do. Yeah. yeah. Um, what uh, what kind of peptides are out there? I know there's some for like injuries. Like I've taken BPC one five seven and TB five hundred. I know it sounds yeah. like I'm speaking another language, but <laughs> that's what these fucking things are called. They are. <laughs> Um, have you guys had some success in yeah, prescribing I really like some of that stuff? Yeah, I like those. I wish I do wish there was more uh, like you know clinical um, and human data on them. Um, but from what we see, they seem to be relatively safe and they seem to be pretty darn effective. Um, they're both compounds that are naturally made as well, um, so we I feel a little bit safer there. What they do, like the, the BPC-157 will actually kind of upregulate growth hormone receptors in the area. So we're usually uh, suggesting the injection in or around the, the injury. So you have some tennis elbow or something, you know, we're uh, suggesting that you inject it in that area so that you get that localized growth hormone receptor upregulation. And then growth, so we tell them to take it before bed too, growth hormone secreted, you get some of that healing benefit from it. Um, and then the, the TB500 promotes something called angiogenesis or the creation of new blood vessels, which can definitely help to improve uh, you know, wound healing thing or tissue healing, wound healing, either one. Um, other peptides that we utilize are some of the growth hormone secretagogues, like tesamorelin, ipamorelin, these type of things. Um, that's one that I, I'm like iffy on. I don't, I don't really believe that much in uh, exogenous growth hormone as being too beneficial, potentially really beneficial as far as injury repair. 
beneficial as far as muscle growth and performance? Probably not, in my opinion. What so, about regular growth hormone? Yeah, so no, I don't, I don't think so. So there's a, I don't think people understand there's a kind of a difference between um, what's like the IGF that is created at the uh, level of the muscle, which is called mechanical growth factor, mm. versus the IGF that's secreted by the liver and that goes systemic, which is more responsible for you know tissue healing um, or, or injury repair. So there is a difference there. Um, and then IGF is actually the thing that we're we're kind of more trying to increase um, the growth hormone. Um, is secreted, tells the liver to produce more of this IGF. But when we work out on things, that's when we produce that mechano growth factor. And that's what's probably responsible for the hypertrophy and the hyperplasia and all of that within the muscle cell. And that's also a peptide, but just it taking is, that directly doesn't yeah, really it doesn't seem, seem to be. Right? Yeah, I don't think it's something. I don't think it's legit. I mean, it's one of those. I have seen it's like MGF and then yeah. a number or something. Right, right. Yeah, but obviously people aren't walking around looking. I mean, there's not many Olympians out there. You <laughs> right, know? right. So it's probably not working. <laughs> So you don't think growth hormone is that effective in general? I'm, I guess if someone had low growth hormone, they took you know, it's hard, a, a yeah, good replacement dose, maybe it would be helpful. Yeah, it's hard. But it's kind of like a anti-aging, longevity thing. People make a huge deal about yeah, it. Yeah, but I think that is definitely uh, misplaced or misguided in mm. my opinion. So as far as longevity goes, I think it's probably one of the worst things you could do. All the longevity medications that we that are implementing, you know, the uh, like the metformin, rapamycin, these things are actually trying to reduce growth and slow down the growth and lower the IGF yeah. because it makes sense that if we're speeding up growth, we're shortening lifespan. You know, we're ramping that growth. So it's kind of uh, it's kind of weird because acutely, yeah, that makes a lot of sense because like yeah. from the time you're like eight to like twenty. That's a huge difference, you're, right? Yeah, you're, yeah, you change so much, yeah. right? And a lot of it has to do your growth hormone, your hormones in your body are going crazy. Right. So you progress and you don't look eight years old anymore. Yeah. <laughs> and then you look at uh, like look at professional bodybuilders. They're like in their late 20s, 30s. The dudes look like 40 and 50. Mm -hmm. you know? they, look, they look bad. Yeah. I even saw that in myself when I was trying to push in the food and pushing the weights, pushing the growth hormone, the test. I'm like, I'm aging. Like, I'm starting to get wrinkles <laughs> and everything. And I started getting way more focused on longevity after that, but... Yeah, I realize like this is really counterintuitive. We mm. are we're taking all this stuff for longevity, but it's probably not. It's probably doing the opposite. Acutely, yeah, it might help with hair, skin, and nails and things like that, and you mm -hmm. may feel a glow, but you're probably ramping up that or shortening the lifespan a bit, which is not so great. Mm. Do you know anything about uh, oral BPC uh, one five seven? If that's the right one, uh, we had a guest on uh, previously, and we were talking about Lucas. Uh, Lucas Owen. Oh or? well, we yeah he's yeah. yeah that guy's no it was uh Taylor Drawl. Mm. I forgot his actual name. I just know that's his Instagram. Maybe but no, he was Taylor. yeah. But um, because we were talking about BP, BPC and for my back, I was just curious. Like, oh, does it have to be like a site injection? And that sounds horrible. <sighs> but he said the oral one could actually work even better than a site injection. So I don't know if do you know anything about that? So when we uh when we deploy the oral more than not, it's more for gut health. Um, because it's actually it was sense. it's uh, it's actually take like a compound that's produced in our gut naturally in order to heal some gut issues. So normally we're giving it uh, more for working within the, the GI um, tract. But I mean that's interesting. I don't really know. Again, mm -hmm. I don't think we have those awesome trials to say. Um, I often wonder that too. Like, is even injecting near the site really helping at the site? Mm -hmm. Part of me says probably not because we know that things don't really work that way. When you inject, it does get into circulation. It is probably going everywhere. So there might be some validity to the fact of taking orally. I don't know. I wish we had more trials. Hmm. I, part of me thinks that the site injection is a little bit of bro lore. You know? <laughs> that bro makes lore. sense. Yeah. Yeah. I like that. That's good. I like that. <laughs> I, I do lore. think. Can we make a I mean, shirt that says that? <laughs> <laughs> we should do that. That's yeah, good. I how to spell it. <laughs> Especially when you're going like subcutaneous. So like the uh, interesting, like the BPC-157 was utilizing Achilles tears, which is interesting to me as a, as a foot and ankle surgeon. Um, they like lanced the, uh, or cut the, uh, the Achilles of, uh, mice and then they injected it into the Achilles. They though. do some fucked up shit to mice. They do. Uh, mice and monkeys. And, yeah. Right. Yeah. I try not to think about it. It's terrible. Mm. But yeah, but they were actually injecting it like into the tendon, not just around the area. Mm -hmm. I mean, like otherwise like, when we injected like growth hormone and things in the, we're not trying to only get it here, you know, <laughs> right. like we want it to go systemic and it does. 
-hmm. And so, yeah, I think there a little bit of braille lore there, mm -hmm. even though I'll recommend to do it because that just seems to be the standard as of right now. Yeah. We don't have the trials. Hopefully one day we do. And you get a little acupuncture effect, yeah. right? I mean, <laughs> you stick the needle in the spot that hurts. That mm -hmm. might be, yeah. You know, you get it. I know needle. like uh, at Westside, they would just inject saline pretty often. Interesting. <laughs> in, Why? in between sets? <laughs> in between sets. <laughs> Just to like, uh, just to cause like disruption in the area. So if you think about like, uh, huh. you're trying to cause like blood flow to a certain area. So if you, mm. oh. if I, you know, aggressively rub on your shoulder, like blood flow is gonna want to mm. go there. So if you, it, it didn't have any harm. It didn't hurt at all. It was just like salt water, basically. I would have put some carnitine or something <laughs> yeah. and get some benefit out of it. Yeah, yeah. Throw something yeah. in there. Yeah. Throw a little bit of testosterone in there while we're Yeah, right? exactly. Yeah. Carnitine's a cool one that I like for a lot of those guys that come in, those younger kids. That's mm -hmm. something we employ a lot. And injectable like. L-carnitine. The injectable L-carnitine, yeah. Uh, that's pretty interesting. It's something I really like. Um, and I especially like with those, you know, the, the kids have like a 600 and they're like, I want a little bit extra edge. What are we I'm, talking about kids? I guess, yeah. Teenagers? Well, I consider like a 20-year-old. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, I should say. <laughs> a <men>. little eight-year-olds. <laughs> These eight-year-olds that come. Oh, shit. I mean, <laughs> soon enough, they all have TikTok and stuff. They probably right, will be yeah. calling up Merrick. Just have their probably. parents' credit card. And <laughs> I want to be on some of that. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh my god uh, but like when these younger adults come in and they have decent testosterone but they do mm -hmm. want that little extra edge and they're not quite ready to jump over to the the testosterone something like l-carnitine can be pretty cool and that's been shown to upregulate the angine receptors so you're basically are giving testosterone more places to bind mm -hmm. to so you're working on that other mm -hmm. side of the equation because mm -hmm. you have the number of testosterone and then just floating around testosterone is not doing a thing until it binds yeah so the idea is basically you give these this more places to bind you get more out of it and we've seen increases in strength and endurance with that. We and then all it has a ton of other benefits too, like reduction in LDL cholesterol, reduction in inflammation. Mm -hmm. Has some uh, neuroprotective benefits, so it can be a pretty cool one to utilize. Um, I know it was utilized in the Olympics with uh, was it Mo Ferrara? Ferrara is that that runner? The Mo Mo something. Mm. And yeah. it's it's not. But the thing about injectable L carnitine too, because we had Andy Triana come on the podcast, and after that, I was like, maybe I should do injectable L carnitine because. There's all these benefits, and it's not illegal at all in no. any type of federation. For anyone. Well, the, uh, that was the issue with that Mo guy. I think it's Mo oh. Ferrara. He was taking too much, I think. Because mm -hmm. it's like, I think you can inject up to like 50 milliliters, I want to say. Mm -hmm. And he was probably like 52 or something. No, he's pushing it a little bit. But mm. the, yeah, the Nike Oregon project was actually IVing it. So to their athletes, <laughs> I mean, they were increasing their mile, they were decreasing their mile time and having awesome benefit with it. Just it just sounds so. Good. It's like a fat oxidator or something. It is, so yeah. Maybe so it helps it, you, you. It ramps know. up that mitochondrial function to get into that beta right. fatty acid oxidation. So kind of switching over that fuel pathway into fat mm. burning, mm. which is cool. beneficial for runners for sure. Yeah. Um, so it does have some benefits, and then we utilize kind of some outside the box things in those naturals too. They're looking to get some like a, a tadalafil, Cialis. Cialis has actually been shown to increase free testosterone, to increase angine receptors as well, um, reduce aromatization, so the testosterone converting to estrogen, kind of uh, leaving some of that testosterone there. It also is going to promote overall blood flow. So you use that you, around training? Yeah. You ever do, done it? It's a great pump product. I, I mean, I'm, have you? I'm, some people have said uh, to take like five milligrams yeah. before training. I've never tried it training-wise. It's pretty good. I did it yesterday when we came in here. I took a little, because I had to work out with Smokey. I'm like, mm -hmm. I better show up. I better look pumped. I know he's going to take mm -hmm. pictures. Wear some uh, gray sweatpants and yeah. <laughs> take some yeah. Cialis and get a workout in. <laughs> well, <laughs> Quick question, so, actually, too. Oh, actually, go ahead. What were you about to say? Oh, I was just going to say the thing with that, too, is I tell people, like, you still have to go down that arousal path. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> like, so you gotta just watch some porn, take some Cialis, and then go no, 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 no. To get an erection, you have to go down oh. the <laughs> No, <Okay>. don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> because sometimes I'm like, you know, I'm telling these kids when I'm like, all right, let's try to optimize what you've got. Let's try something like L carnitine to Dalafil or something. And, mm -hmm. and they're like, well, aren't I just gonna have an erection at the gym? I'm like, well, hopefully not. I mean, maybe if you see somebody you're super attracted to, but you know, you do have to go down that. It's not, I think like 40 year old virgin, he just like popped one and then held up. <laughs> like, that's probably not gonna happen, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. I, I, I wanna know about this because, you know, some people do use Viagra or Cialis. I've tried, um, I've tried Blue Chew before yeah. just because I was just like, I wonder what this will do. And that shit's wild. Yeah. But I, I wonder if somebody is like, I wanna do this all the time. <laughs> is there, well, there, like, just like we were talking about melatonin, 
and caffeine is will it mess with the ability of the individual to get hard on their own if they depend too much on Cialis and all this shit to get super hard? No, probably not because the pathway that it works is kind of interesting. Um, what happens is the blood flows to like the erection, the penis, and then there's a the there's an enzyme that basically kicks on to mm -hmm. reduce the erection. This is blocking that, so it's a um, it's a phosphodiesterase inhibitor, mm -hmm. and so it's knocking out that enzyme so that it can stay hard. And so it doesn't change anything about the getting hard; it changes things about how well it stays. Does that make sense? I'm gonna. I know what I'm getting from wow. Eric next. <laughs> some, some Tadalafil. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> if there's gonna be no really long term. So it yeah. seems from everything we see, it seems to have a lot of health benefits too. So it's gonna help with. <laughs> obviously helps with prostate health because it's a it's a medication that's actually prescribed for that. It's on label yeah. uses for um, that benign prostatic hyperplasia. So it can help to reduce the growth of pro uh, your prostate, which is great for guys on TRT if they're afraid of that. Um, it's also promoting blood flow throughout the entire body. So that's uh -huh. improving that endothelial function, the lining of the, the arteries that we get afraid of. Uh, so it's promoting that nitric oxide, which helps to reduce plaque buildup and things. There's been some research on it showing to have some cognitive protective benefits too. So. Whoa. Yeah, is this something that we can take like as like a daily vitamin, like in a yeah. dose? No, no yeah. I'm serious. Because if I, I know you're serious, that's actually how I, we recommend it. Okay, cool. Yeah. Because the, the one time I tried to take it pre workout, I just had the most insane headache. So that's yeah, I'm the exact same way. Okay, um, I I'll tell these guys a lot. Like I w like we suggest that you take it daily, low dose, like two point five to five milligrams. But some people are super sensitive to it, and I'm one of them. Um, it gives me a, like a headache. It makes me feel s s terrible mm -hmm. stuff, sinuses. The first mm. experience I ever had with one was in undergrad. I uh, had a hundred milligram Viagra that I ordered from <sighs> India, <laughs> which I didn't, I thought, I didn't know. Oh. I'm like, oh, Viagra. And you know, I go out on this date <laughs> and then I pop that and I had to go home alone too because it just didn't work out in my favor. But I went home alone with a raging migraine. Like I woke up in the <laughs> middle of the night thinking I had meningitis because it's the worst headache I've ever had. Yeah. And then, yeah. yeah. And then I, I found that I'm pretty sensitive. So I'll take like two milligrams, 2.5. That's good. Because, yeah, I think I took 10 or 20 milligrams. And yeah. I was just like, oh, I'm not having a good yeah. day. It was not fun. I've had, like, I, some patients tell me that they push through that and eventually it goes away. I'm like, that's crazy. I, I don't like, I don't, no, I don't really good. like the pain. Hey, yeah. anything for love, right? Yeah. I do say that, like, <laughs> taking as needed. And that's all I'll tell them. I'm like, well, then just get it as needed. And, you know, like, I'll... I'll whist, I'll take a headache. Hey, if you it's, know, I've yeah. worked through hamstring cramps exactly. and stuff like that before, right? Yeah. You still you still got a job to do. Exactly. Yeah, <laughs> I'm like it, it'll benefit me more in the bed. Like if I want to go work out with somebody like Smokey, who's a beast in the gym, is going to show me up. I'm like, mm -hmm. all right, it's worth a headache to have a little bit <laughs> good pumps. So I can be next to him. I can fill out that that XL, all right. And then, uh, or it's worth it if you want to please a lady. You know, you guys are going away, and you're like, I really want to show up tonight. Like, <laughs> I can. Ta I'll take a little prophylactic ibuprofen. Yeah. You know? Uh, okay, uh, uh, let's let's go down this a little bit more. You know, let's do it. will somebody if they if they keep taking it, will they sometimes like will they build a tolerance? Like for example, you take too much pre workout, you need more to get the same effect. Is that because I'm gonna get some? I'm gonna start super low, but will there be a time where like oh I need to start taking more because it's not hitting the same? Would that happen with it? Do you see cases of that? I haven't seen it personally. It's a good question. I don't know. I'm sure there's probably some literature on it too. I would suspect not. But mm. yeah, we'll have to look. In, I have to say I don't really know. Mm. I'll okay. make sure. I'll, I'll look it up and get you the the data before you jump yeah. into it. We don't want to. I'm, I'm going to jump in, you but I just want to know how, how <laughs> deep do I need to go? Yeah. I'm, I'm a, this sounds like a lot of fun. Well, well, it's, I it's, just like it as the as needed. And I think, I mean, yeah. I do think that all the health benefits probably come from like daily dosing of a small amount, mm -hmm. but I'm just not somebody who tolerates it that well. So the as needed can be fun for sure. I actually didn't get a headache yesterday either. Maybe I'm building up a tolerance to the the side mm -hmm. effects as it was Ooh. fine. Okay. And to daphanil, that's C Cialis. Cialis, okay. yeah. And then sure. there's Viagra, which is like sildenafil. And then uh, what's the difference? Some, the half-life is a big thing. So, okay. and that's why I like it too, especially for if you're taking it for like the bedroom. Um, the half-life of the Cialis is something like 17 hours. So it's probably in your system for like 30 or so. Mm -hmm. um, the half-life of the Viagra is only a few, like two to four. So it can definitely get a bit awkward if you're like, 
a lot of times you don't want to tell the the partner that you're about to pop one, you know? <laughs> and then you got to like plan it really well Maybe as far as time goes. hour, get yeah. down here. <laughs> exactly. And then <laughs> the, the Viagra <laughs> seems to interact pretty significantly with food too. And so if you went out on a date and got some food, like mm-hmm. you're probably going to be messing up the absorption mm-hmm. of it. Where the Cialis, it's nice. You can take it at 8 a.m. in the morning as your morning routine still working at night when you meet up with her, you know, it's cool. And she never has to know. Dude, I'm in. You're actually enhanced. I'm in. in. You're no longer natty. (laughs) It uh, (laughs) it does lower your blood pressure, right? Yeah, that could be a positive benefit too. In my opinion, I think people need to take a much more aggressive approach at their blood pressure. Uh, We actually prefer like a 115 over 75, and we found anything above that. It's actually been well known for, well documented for a long time. Anything above that increases risk of cardiovascular disease. So even the normal uh, U.S. recommendations or the American Heart Association or whoever puts out the recommendations for hypertension at like the 120 over 80 is probably still a bit high too. Mm. So I'm big on blood pressure, especially like I said with uh, performance enhancers. I think they definitely need to have some blood pressure medication in. Mm. Absolutely. What uh, what about um, the like viscosity? Because like my my hematocrit's like always been really high, Mm -hmm. um, probably due to uh, well definitely due to SARMs, but also from (laughs) snoring. Um, oh, yeah. So it's always been really high. Does it help with like thinning of the blood at all? No, I, no? I don't think okay. so. So, but the blood pressure medication, one that I really like is called Telmosartan. Um, one of the uh, one of the side effects to um, the ARBs or the angiotensin II receptor blockers is anemia. So in somebody like you or a performance enhancer, that's an amazing side effect to have that we're reducing the blood cell count. Mm. So it's actually in reducing the thickness of the blood. So it's Shit. it's a great addition. The Telmosartan is one, like uh, a lot of people come to us too just for kind of getting these, uh, these outside the box esoteric things like uh, metformin or something, even though they're not diabetic, which is when I take daily, I take metformin and I take Telmosartan daily and I don't mm. have diabetes or high blood pressure. But they have these longevity benefits. They agonize these uh, these different receptors and have all these awesome benefits. And so we get people coming to us that are like that. You know, they're fans of David Sinclair and things, and they're really into the longevity. And, and then, you know, I'm interested in metformin, but I told my doc, and he looked at me like I was crazy because I have a 5.2 A1C and I'm healthy, mm-hmm. and we can work with that too. So it's not all about hormone replacement. Is we definitely push on that optimization as far as longevity. Sometimes maybe just for cosmetics, like we do have access to some pretty cool topical peptides and things for reducing fine lines or hair loss is a big one you know mm. all anything goes into human optimization we're trying to cover power project family i hope you guys are enjoying this episode now mark andrew and myself have been cold plunging for a while now we actually use the cold plunge xl but the reason why this has become part of our daily routine every single day is because of honestly how good it makes us feel coming out of that water now if you want to take a cold shower, that is beneficial and you need to be doing that if you don't have a cold plunge. But if you do get a cold plunge that goes all the way down to 39 degrees, it's crazy because Andrew Huberman actually talked about the benefits of dopamine post cold plunging. Now, cocaine gives you a 2.5 rise in your dopamine release. Cold plunging gives you that also, but it also gives you a sustained higher level of dopamine throughout your day. That's just one of the benefits, as there are many. So if you guys want to get on it, Andrew, how can they? Oh, yes. You guys got to head over to thecoldplunge.com and at checkout, enter promo code POWERPROJECT to save $150 off. And before we drop off here, I do have to say that this has been the absolute best thing I have ever done for my mental health. Every single day I get in this cold plunge and I come out a happier, more positive, and more vibrant human. I can't recommend this enough. Again, thecoldplunge.com, promo code Power Project to save $150 off. Links to them down in the description as well as the podcast show notes. You know, on the on the longevity thing, I was really wondering about this because, you know, you see some um, you see some older guys getting on test uh, or maybe they're just doing a lot of stuff, right? And people think of the quality of life versus the length span, yeah. lifespan. The health span versus, the health span lifespan. versus yeah. lifespan. So I, I, I wonder about testosterone when it comes to longevity and your actual lifespan because you'll feel more like let's say you're 50 years old 55 you'll feel more vibrant Mm -hmm. but is there a is there a sweet spot for feeling more vibrant and having a lifespan benefit because people can go really hard with that shit they feel great but then high blood pressure thick blood blah blah you will die soon yeah (laughs) right so what is that middle ground yeah it's probably again because i do think having too low of testosterone is going to reduce lifespan and health span for sure because we know that having too low of testosterone terrible for your brain terrible for your heart Mm -hmm. terrible for all kinds of things having too high same exact stuff it's kind of like everything in life like even water you know too little of it you're dehydrated too much of it you die of volume overload yeah and so 
testosterone fits within that category too, hitting that sweet spot. So you probably are getting an increase in not only lifespan, but also health span. If by whatever chance, I, I mean, this study recently or this meta-analysis recently showed no, no increased risk of cardiovascular disease in short and midterm. If one day we find out that 50 years on causes increased mortality, mm -hmm. I think that we've improved their life significantly. You know, it doesn't yeah. really make sense. I would so much rather die at 80 being fit and playing with my grandkids and like, you know, having fun and being able to work out and take walks and mm -hmm. do my own stuff rather than living to 90 or 100 in a wheelchair, having yes. somebody do everything for me. And so that's sometimes I think the longevity people get a little bit too into like, oh, we'll take all these things, like like inhibit all this me, uh, mTOR, mTOR and take, yeah. you know, all that. And I'm like, why, man? Like, you're going to be so frail and fast all day. And they're like, you know, 110 pounds. They already look like if they fall, they're going to break every bone in their body. And, yeah. I'm like, you're going to try to get to 100 like this? Mm -hmm. But the overall, the umbrella that we see, I think that people don't look into enough is like, the people who live the longest and the healthiest have increased strength and muscle mass, you know? Mm. And so if we can help them to improve their their fitness and their strength, specifically more strength than even muscle, that's a big thing. Cause you need to you need to be able to stop yourself from falling, or if you do fall, get yourself up, things mm -hmm. like that, you know, that become an issue. And I mean, if you're not strong when you're older, that's gonna be a big issue. Living long is kind of dumb. Yeah. <laughs> People well, that live really long are usually really small. They're usually very, very small. That's true. Like not a whole lot you can do about that. Like Same being, with animals. Right. Small animals live longer than mm -hmm. big ones. Being short and just not weighing a lot. I'm not able to do, I'm not able to figure that one out. Yeah. <laughs> I think but, we're going to start to see a lot of like people like your size mm -hmm. living longer because we, yeah, we perhaps. know how to, we know how to keep our health in right, check. Right. Like back, what, 70, 50, 60 years ago, you know, when people were living a long time, they also didn't know exactly what to do. Right. Like they weren't eating enough protein to maintain muscle on their frame. Right. They weren't doing a lot of things. I think we're going to see a lot of jacked old people that live till 90, mm -hmm. 95, but they also have a high level of like, you know, life's like they, they have a good quality of right. life too. Yeah. Yeah, definitely I possible. Do. I do think that we should put way more emphasis on the actual training and the, the strength and things than we do. Not just thinking about all these small little minutia, like taking metformin or it's fasting and everything. That's probably, I mean, it might be beneficial. But that <laughs> might be like a few percent. But the massive majority is probably going to be train, you know, a lot do of it some resistance be, training and some cardiovascular. A lot of it would also be stress mitigation, right? That's like, big. so mm. what do you do for that? Live in a cave, like right. just not live your life. Like yeah. if you just, if you don't have an aim and you don't do anything, then yeah, maybe you're less stressed. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> I'm sure that we could put somebody on a lab and make all the perfect everything, get them, you know, fast them for a certain amount of time, expose them to a certain amount of cold, expose them to a certain amount of heat. But like, right. how miserable would that be? <laughs> right, right. You know, that's why it does like, that's how I am even with diet. Like, you know, maybe there's some benefit in some of these things, a small benefit, but like that sucks. It's just not the world we live in anymore. Like we aren't cavemen anymore. That's not the world we live in. We don't have to always be saying, what did our ancestors do? Even that, I think, is kind of a dumb argument because our ancestors probably didn't live very long. You know, they, I don't, I'm not all about like, oh, our ancestors did this. I'm like, that was, that's probably suboptimal. Mm -hmm. We can literally, like, your ancestors didn't do testosterone, but you seem like you want to. You know, like, there's they a lot. They would have used a cell phone if they had one. Exactly. They mm -hmm. didn't have private jets and cell phones and things. <laughs> that's Speaking it. of ancestral stuff, you seem to have referenced the Liver King a couple times. Yeah. And uh, my brother, um, recently has linked up with you guys and instead of getting uh, a um instead of getting thyroid medication he was uh uh recommended to take thiamus which is thyroid from a cow so what are some of your thoughts on replacing uh or fixing something in the body with something from an animal sure yeah so i actually didn't even realize that his liver king's supplement brand is ancestral mm -hmm. something Mm -hmm. Yeah, I didn't know that until I have just haven't really followed the guys. He falls into that category that I don't like of like too extreme and, and they're just trying to sell something, which is fine. Everybody needs to sell something, but I do think it comes at the risk of people sometimes, which I don't like. Um, but I didn't know of that until I had three patients actually come in saying that they were, they have hypothyroidism. So they have an issue with their thyroid. They got off of their prescribed medication and started taking this ancestral beef, natural desiccated thyroid. And each of them had terrible thyroid markers because they thought that it was thyroid medication too. Mm -hmm. 
I don't know much about, I haven't looked into his stuff much, but it doesn't seem to be like the natural desiccated thyroid or the armor thyroid that we prescribe. So that's how it can, that kind of stuff can be harmful. Like we do prescribe very often natural desiccated thyroid from pig thyroid that mm-hmm. is produced in a laboratory, not sold over the counter, you know, and it actually helps. So how we can tell is we're looking for thyroid stimulating hormone, TSH. When you're taking exogenous thyroid, that TSH should basically be down because your your pituitary shouldn't be secreting it. It shouldn't be telling your thyroid to produce uh, any thyroid hormone, very similar to testosterone with like luteinizing hormone, follicle stimulating hormone. So they came in and their TSH is off the roof. So obviously there's no active thyroid in his medication. It's not a medication, but supplement. Right. But that's where it, that kind of stuff can be harmful is if you're telling people that you can eat an organ and it's going to heal the organ or, you know, you can take this supplement and it's going to be better than your prescribed supplement. Mm-hmm. That's not necessarily always the case. Mm. And so that's how I think that that kind of like his, some of his claims and things can definitely be detrimental. But in some cases, if it has the active ingredient, it can help your thyroid. Is that Absolutely, what you're saying? Yeah. But I think there must be, I don't see, I haven't looked into it enough, but there must be some regulation that says you can't sell thyroid hormone over the counter, mm. right? Because it is prescription only. And so I don't think you can just walk into Walgreens and buy right. some active thyroid hormone. It has to be from across the counter from your doctor's prescription. Mm-hmm. But he is he's putting natural desiccated thyroid on the label and people right. think they're getting it. What they are probably getting, which is probably beneficial, is the cofactors and things that are found alongside of the thyroid. Mm-hmm. And there's probably a lot of benefit to taking some aspects of natural desiccated thyroid, but not a replacement. Is that his fault? Probably not so much as the consumer's fault. You know, they probably should look into it a bit more and, and do their research before right. jumping off. So I get that argument for sure. It's just unfortunately, people usually aren't that intelligent. We can kind of exploit them and I think yeah, that's Yeah, he where, takes kind of a hard stance on like your liver can potentially help your liver. And it would seem to actually make more sense that all organs can help all organs and that if you're eating natural foods that it can just help your body in general, yeah. especially if you're staying away from processed foods. Yeah. Um, but it's not like a one-to-one, like right. I have a, you know, a liver issue, I'm going to take a liver supplement. Yeah. No, and and yeah, I don't. I really don't know much about the guy. I'm not trying to make a, like – jabs at him it's just the hot topic right now right like that's everybody's he's kind of on and good for him he's obviously marketing himself well Mm -hmm. um it's just he is one of many he's just right now he's the hot flavor right now but there's been conversely i mean even like lane norton for a while i I like the guy a lot but for a while he did kind of promote the eat pop tarts and and m&ms and shit all day and you can get lean and that was a bit too extreme and i think he admits it to this day too like yeah i probably pushed a little bit too hard on that that doesn't work for everybody it's just, I always kind of, uh, I don't like when anybody is trying to push these crazy claims too hard on people and it could be deleterious to people. Like Lane's recommendations at one point probably caused some people to gain some excess body fat and stuff because they were thinking, well, Lane Norton's got a PhD and he says I can eat Pop-Tarts and stuff. And he'll be the first one to be like, no, that's not what I said, but people interpreted it wrong. Take Eventually it he realized like, oh, I'm, I'm putting this out the wrong way. Like people, people aren't, uh, it's not hitting them the way that I wanted it to, you know? Mm-hmm. You talk to, with, with people that have maybe uh, previous bad habits, you tell them they can eat Pop-Tarts and they're going to overeat. Yeah. I mean. And so he was trying to direct them towards like, hey, if you stay in a caloric deficit, you'll still yeah. be okay. You'll still be able to get ripped. Right. And it's hard for people to hear that because for some people, once they triggered something, uh, yeah. It's game on. And that's what I do. I do mainly like if it fits your macros, there's nothing that I that's off limits for me. I fit everything in, but that works for me. And it doesn't work for everybody. You know, some people really like to have a, a regimen. They like to have restriction. They like to be told you can't have these foods. For me, I'm the exact opposite. You tell me I can't eat cookies, I can't think of anything else mm-hmm. but cookies, you know? Are you also getting all of your carbohydrates through Kashi cereal? No, probably not. <laughs> I, right? I, I usually don't. <laughs> I hardly even eat that much cereal. But that's the thing. Like, I take a much more. I think most people could probably just benefit from eating whole foods. Yeah, you know, like eat eat some meat, eat some vegetables, eat some fruit. Eat some. I I believe in grains and and carbohydrates too. I don't think there's anything wrong with them. Mm-hmm. Going back to the ancestral thing, we've seen grains in the uh, with that. Cave, I guess he's kind of a caveman. He was that frozen dude that they found in uh, <laughs> where is Ireland? Yeah, you know, the mm. the oldest man they found. They found grains in his gut, so he was eating mm-hmm. grains. Mm-hmm. All of the the uh, instruments that we found from the cavemen, they had like um, they had grains on them, so they were actually like you know producing wheat and things like that and grinding it up. 
So like cavemen probably had some grains too. It makes sense. It's right there. It has calories and it. it can fuel them. Why wouldn't they eat it? Yeah. So like, you know, they probably ate what was available to them, be it fruit, vegetables, animals, yeah. you know, animals were the big one because they had the most calories in them. You take down a bison, you're eating for a month probably, you know, mm -hmm. but I'm sure that they weren't, they weren't turning away a, a vegetable when they saw it or a berry or something, you know, Yeah. Mm -hmm. or, or <clears throat> grains if they, after they learned how to, to mill it and everything. Um, so yeah, I kind of take the approach of if you can eat the least processed stuff that you can. And then it, sometimes we do live in this world where there's processed stuff around. I don't think you're going to, it comes back to the quality of life, you know, yeah. If you're at a party and there's cake going around and it's your grandma's birthday, you know, are you going to say no to that cake because your ancestor didn't eat it? Probably not. Let's have the cake, you know, enjoy your time. And then uh, maybe eat a little bit less potatoes later on. <laughs> yeah. That's how I look at it. Mm -hmm. Some people do, it, they have that piece of cake and it puts them down a spiral, you know, and that, that where that's where it can be bad. But I'm not allowed to eat the cake. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> but that probably comes from years of an unhealthy relationship with food already. You know, mm -hmm. most kids and stuff, they... If we didn't, if we didn't subject them to our unhealthy relationships with food, most kids will just eat until they're full and then get back to playing or something, you know. And then we we've had sometimes uh, by the fault of our parent, even by saying finish that plate and you're not moving this table until you finish that plate, and then you can't have dessert until you eat more calories by finishing your plate. You know, it's kind of mm -hmm. wrong. We've probably put a lot of wrong habits into kids from day one. We probably should have just put the food in front of them, let them eat to their desire, and then go about their day. Or if yeah. they want to move on to dessert, fine, you know. Make sure maybe they, they hit their protein. Like maybe instead of saying finish your plate, just finish your protein serving, and then you can have a little bit extra carbohydrates from the, the sweets, you know. Mm -hmm. My opinion. Hey, I'm that, not pushing it on everybody, but. Yeah, that yeah. that that actually makes a lot of, I mean, I always finish my plate as a kid, and I always finish my plate as an adult. Yeah. <laughs> like I will never, you won't see anything on that plate. No matter how much you put on it, I'm not going to throw that food away. It's ingrained in me. Yeah. So was well, that because your parents? Yeah, my yeah. mom. My mom. I finished my mom's food. Yeah, the same way here. You know, so yeah. I ain't gonna. I ain't gonna turn you. I fill my plate. I eat my plate. That's yeah. how it works. Yeah. Sometimes it's probably not great. It's not kids. great. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to, to be like, before you eat more food, you got to finish all this food. That's like the requirement is eating more food to get to more food. Yeah. <laughs> and then they just keep doing that, and they're like, oh, man, I don't really want to finish this meal, but I really want that ice cream. Let me finish this meal, and then I'll have that. You know. Yeah. Finish your French fries. Yeah. Finish it's French like, fries before you move on to your McFlurry. It's like what? <laughs> yeah. yeah. That make any sense? Oh, um, we were talking earlier about kids and kids like being, you know, talking or talking about kids, uh, teenagers and so forth, like pursuing performance enhancing drugs. And my take on this is I think that maybe kids are just kind of changing their drugs. Like kids and drugs have always. You know, yeah, uh, teenagers and drugs have always kind of gone hand in hand. That's true. I didn't even think about that. Uh, when the news hits and they're like, teenagers having sex and teenagers <laughs> doing it's like. You don't say. It's like, Jesus Christ, this has been going on, you know, for, yeah. forever. You know, it's been going on forever. So I think that kids are just uh, maybe making different decisions with the style of drugs and the st lifestyle that they might want to live. Uh, whereas years ago, maybe they were messing around more so with other types of drugs um, you're hearing more and more people talking about uh, psychedelic uh, uh, type of drugs. You're hearing more people talking about performance enhancing drugs. Joe Rogan yeah. talks about it quite often. And um, I would just say this, you know, having kids myself and, you know, with my son, if I walked in his room and he's shooting some steroids. You're going to say, give me some? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, it would be a much different conversation than yeah. if I walked into his room and a handful of times I saw that he was passed out on the floor and he yeah. pissed himself, you okay. know, from drinking too much. Makes sense. So I'm not saying I want kids to do any right. type of thing, but uh, if they're going to be influenced by these like different types of drugs, you know, at this, at this time, uh, I think the cat's already out of the bag. Mm -hmm. The information's already out. So it's kind of just hard to, ho hopefully uh, people will try to figure out a way to do it in a safe way, but even come to America, even, <laughs> even given that scenario, um, a lot of people have messed around with steroids. And I, again, I'm, I'm a pretty big believer that a lot of the side effects can be reversed. Um, there, it always depends, you know, like, like somebody can take a crazy amount of shit yeah. and they can, uh, have effects that are less than, than desirable, but it's kind of just the way I've been looking at That's it. A, like, would I'd rather have somebody, uh, you know, messing with uh, some really hardcore drugs 
or would I rather have them looking at, yeah, maybe I want to take a little bit of uh, Anivar or something yeah. like that. To me, again, what do I know? But it seems to be less harmful and it seems to be kind of a positive. It's like heading towards a goal, I guess you'd say, whereas like what's the goal of snorting cocaine? Yeah, <laughs> that's know. a way to look. Yeah, I haven't even thought of that, but it makes sense. I would say the issue probably comes with those other drugs are probably still there too and now they're yes. adding, you know. Some kids though might just get on that straight and narrow of like fitness is my life and that's awesome because it usually comes, you usually aren't dabbling in other drugs when you get really down the rabbit hole of fitness and stuff. You know, usually not, I would say. Would you guys agree? Like even drinking becomes something that you're not really that interested in because you're like, that's probably going to hinder my gains. Yeah. And From so, what I've yeah. seen oftentimes, yeah. Yeah. So you're probably right. That's something that's interesting to think about. And then as far as like the, I would say though that I do think there are a lot of side effects that are irreversible. Um, but we do have more knowledge now and we have places like we have educators, we have people like Derek, you know, obviously he puts out decent, great videos for that stuff. Um, John Jewett, the 212 uh, Olympian guy, he mm. has a really, him and Victor work very closely together. So there's all these good sources of this the more safer use model. Um, and then you can probably facilitate that through somebody like Merrick, which you used to not be able to. You know, if you were 18 before and you you couldn't go to your primary care and be like, hey, I'm looking, I want to do this trend cycle and get on stage. And like, I would like to have some metformin. I'd like to have some telmosartan and, you know, some L-carnitine. They're not going to give it to you. But now we do have a pretty good amount of educators that you can start getting a good uh, knowledge base on, not just bodybuilding.com forums or Reddit forums. Mm -hmm. And then you can go and get actual help from clinics like Merrick or other uh, well-educated docs who can kind of help with that. So yeah, I would say you're right. Something I haven't even thought about. I should take a less uh, harsh opinion of these younger guys trying to jump on stuff. The other side of it, which I think is always something of concern, again, is the mental side. Yeah. If you're young, you just haven't had a lot of life experiences right. yet. Your brain's not fully developed. Yeah. And any influence of anything, like who the fuck knows what happens. Yeah, you and know? I do think you should probably try to just push the hell out of those natural things first. First, learn how to train. Like... I to the I've been lifting out for like 15 years. I probably still don't fully understand proper training. You know, like mm -hmm. that's people like you and your friends and stuff. The top level guys have really perfected that, and that's why you made crazy gains. And then also perfect the eating, perfect everything else first. You have a lot of years where you can run off that natural production. Like if you start at 14, 15. Like, go until you're 22 or so and optimize the hell out of it. Dial everything else in so that when you do start to sprinkle in that stuff, that is just the thing that takes you from great to amazing, you know? An interesting thing that I, I just, I, I think is just so unique is if a guy chooses to hop on and they get bigger for a while, if they do lower or go down um, or stop, they end up in a different body. Like, I looked at, uh, you know, I've thought about Pete Rubish. You know, Pete yeah. Rubish, um, years ago, a guy was deadlifting seven, eight. He was huge, yacked, right? And I, I don't I don't know why he chose to stop, but he did. And Pete is a different human, looks like a different human being. And I just wonder, what does that do to somebody mentally? If you literally, you took yourself to a point of becoming Superman, and now you're normal again. How do you rectify that? How how are yeah. like how it's do you hard. feel about yourself? Even in myself, like uh, last year this time I was 225 pounds. Now I'm 205 because I've just been focusing much more on longevity. Mm -hmm. But there's the times I'm in the gym and I'm just like, Fuck, I'm not the biggest guy in here anymore, you know. And it's kind of hard mm -hmm. mentally. And then I got to talk to myself like. You know, there's you have bigger goals. There's other things. You're not just this. And uh, recently, like I don't know if you guys listened to uh, the Foo Ads podcast, the Real Bodybuilding podcast. Uh, it's fun to listen to. It's just bros talking. But uh, Foo Ads interesting because he's one who retired recently, and so now he's running a lot more. He's losing a significant amount of weight. But they're talking about that a lot. Where you know he was this 300 pound giant on the Olympia stage, Ooh. and now he's down to like 250 or so, and trying to cut more. And the mental aspect of that. And then the uh, other bodybuilder, um, Ben Chow, had to quit because of kidney reasons. Same thing. He's losing weight. And they're, they kind of get on there. It's like cathartic for them to talk about this. Mm -hmm. They don't even like to go in the gym half the time anymore because it just feels like, you know, it sucks. Workout quality is terrible. They're not the biggest guy in there anymore. Yeah. They've uh, they've both talked about, which is probably something that you kind of get too out of it, Mark. Like they're, uh, Ben's, I think, cycling, Fuad's running. Um, probably very similar to why, like, you're running, you know, mm -hmm. like, you know you can't lift the weights that you used to, so it kind of sucks to even try, but you do need an outlet. For sure. And so you just change your path, you know? Mm -hmm. and so I think there's ways to get around it, but I don't think it's easy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
But yeah. the whole body thing can't be real because, I mean, look at the size of you. Like, you must have used to been on, and now you still look like... I'm just kidding. Because <laughs> <laughs> we already an, determined you're natural. <laughs> right that is an interesting oh, thing. I think God. people think that they can do them, and yeah. then they can stop them, and then they can hold on to their gains. And uh, I guess it would depend on, like, how many years you've been training for and yeah. stuff like that. Like, there's so many other factors, but... I think you can hold on to a decent amount. But probably, I mean, you're obviously not going to look that same way. Everything is going to be different. Just even the way that you hold on to glucose and everything, you know, the glycogen retention and all that, it's all going to be different. I personally don't like, think you can hold on to any of it. No? <laughs> I, I mean, like, again, it would depend on when, you know, like if you took it while you're a teenager, of course. Oh, oh, I thought you meant glycogen. Yeah. I thought you were going to give me a carnivore. No, I just meant like. I was like, huh. No, you I just meant testosterone. Yes, yeah, no, or, no. Or, or I meant uh, performance enhancing drugs. Yeah. I well, don't think you can really keep any of it. Yeah, and I mean, maybe there's small amounts, but like, if you got yourself to like 270 and you're yeah, fucking big, no, you, you're not. You'll gonna, probably down to like 220 or so. You know, I mean, I, th- I, I mean, I just for my own experience, like I, I weigh about five pounds lighter than I did when I was like 16, mm-hmm. um, and then even if I take myself in like my best shape without being on anything, uh, I was around 215, 220. I would weigh that same amount. I would go back to that same. Yeah. And I think over time, like I don't think it would happen right away, uh, but two years, five years, like I think I, I would. Do you think you'd downsize to where your genetic potential could have potentially led you naturally? So say you could have gotten to this size naturally, but you ramped up to 280 or whatever, and then when you get off, you just go back to wherever your natural set point is. I that's like, yeah. that's kind of what I think, yeah. Yeah. I, that can make sense. That's kind I don't, of. I, think. I don't think we have any like data on it or anything. Right, but right. Again, much of what we do doesn't have data on it. I mean, look at like Jay Cutler or someone like that. I mean, he's holding on to tremendous size, but he's also. I don't think he came off of everything. Yeah, I think he's on TRT. I think. He and he probably looked amazing him. before he got on anything because yeah. he's fucking Jay Cutler, right? Yeah, and that's the thing too. I think if I think I'm kind of thinking of it differently. I'm thinking of coming off blasting and going onto a cruise or a TRT, and I think that's going to help you to maintain it because, like I talked about, you're going to keep right. those steady levels. If you blasted for years and came off to nothing, yeah, you're gonna shrink. You're gonna shrivel up, yeah, uh, and probably in front of people's eyes. Well, I just want, I think it's important for people to know they should like yeah. that. It's you. If you can hold on to something, it would be very minimal. Yeah, and so I think people are like, oh, I'm gonna do a couple cycles when I'm, you know, in my 20s, and I'm gonna get big, and I'm gonna hold that. And yeah. It's like it doesn't it doesn't not work that way. Yeah, and I, I, and when you're younger too, and you just you don't think about the future. And I haven't I didn't even start thinking about the future until probably like I don't know. About to turn 34, probably just like three years ago, it started kind of dawning on me. <laughs> really in the last like year more than anything yeah. where I'm like, I care a lot more about career and my family and setting up a future. Mm-hmm. Before it was just kind of like, you know, no, like live fast, die young. And I just, I didn't think, I wasn't actively thinking that way, but it was yeah. kind of the things I was doing, you know, I wasn't really thinking about the future. And mm-hmm. when you're a kid, that's why you are snorting coke and shooting things up or nowadays popping pills because you're not thinking about the future and the same kind of happens with that. Yeah. But if we could just be like, dude, this is going to mess you up. Like you're going to be smaller. You're going to, you know, you're, you're going to have all these issues. You may have libido issues for life. Like you may have all this thing, but it's hard to get across them. And, but I get your point. Like I might rather them mess around with some anabolics rather than some, uh, some cocaine or the opiates and things now or fentanyl and you know, all that terrible stuff. I think that is something that more people kind of need to explore because it does kind of seem like, you know, okay, maybe if somebody just goes on some tests, okay, you'll get bigger. You'll gain some muscle. It might not be anything crazy, but if you choose to open Pandora's box and take some heavier things, that's going to put 30, 40 pounds of muscle on you. That, that, it's it's still something I, I'm, I'm just like, God, that that must be fucking crazy. It's like you now weigh 40 pounds less because you're choosing not to do it anymore. You're not the same human. Yeah. You literally, you, you don't even perceive yourself as the same individual. Yeah, because that becomes your identity. That becomes your identity. Yeah. It happens really fast too, right? Whereas if you were doing it the natural route, it would mm. take a couple years, which you would have to kind of like work for and you would notice every day and like, or maybe you wouldn't notice as much because it's slower. Yeah. But when you gain that muscle mass and that strength that quickly... Yeah. Uh, you do feel like a fucking superhero. Yeah, true. But only I think if you employ the right eating and and, and work too. Yeah, I do. I do really think that the work and the 
all the lifestyle shit is so much more important than people put into it. And I really, did, I used to kind of fall into that class of, oh, they're just doing steroids. Like, mm-hmm. you know, I was, I was competitive in CrossFit and stuff for a while, not like on the games level, but locally competitions. And I would look at the games level like, well, they're doing growth hormone <laughs> and they've got a good hookup. That's why I'm not that. And I'm like, yeah. now I'm much more of a believer in, no, those dudes work their asses off. They put in the work, like first and foremost, like mm-hmm. I, I know you joked around about it, Mark, but I'm I'm sure your work was way more than any drugs ever did. Like it was the grind. It was the getting up and getting your ass to the gym when you didn't feel like it. It was the shoveling the meal when you didn't feel like it. The going to bed, the skipping the parties, you know, like that. And that's the stuff that people don't get dialed in first and they should. I'm all for a 20 year old wanting to start things, if it, but like get all that other stuff in because if you just throw that in and don't do any of that, you're not going to get the results. Now you've wasted money and you've wasted and you've hurt your health. If you're going to hurt your health, at least get something out of it, in my opinion, mm-hmm. you know? Like, and, I think the Olympians, they understand that they're putting themselves at risk. But look where they're getting out of it. It's, that's their career. They're making, you know, their money off it. They're setting up their future be- that way. And so there's a lot of things that we do that, you know, you could say that, uh, you know, police officers and stuff putting themselves in harm for their, you know, same type of thing. They're putting themselves in harm in a different way. But if you're going to employ it, make sure that you get all of it that you can. Don't just put, stick the needle in your butt and expect to turn into Mark or you. You know, it's not going to happen. Mm-hmm. It's, it's not. Mm-hmm. They, and I mean, yeah, they might make a small bit more gains than other people, but they're not going to turn out to be the elite lifter that they think they are. Yeah. And long term, like you mentioned, some of those guys end up stopping working out. Now, I'm not going to say that they didn't love exercise because, I mean, if, uh, if he got up to 300 pounds, even if he was on stuff, he must have loved the gym. But... Uh, you know, I don't see myself stopping working out yeah. for any reason because number one, I've enjoyed it for such a long time. And number two, it's not just for how I look in the mirror. It's for all the other benefits right. it gives me mentally outside of yeah. the gym and what it's doing for me. So if you don't love it and you only enjoy it because of the amount of size you see yourself gaining week by week, year by year, and then you aren't gaining that anymore, uh, shit, that's, that's, not, that's not good. You yeah. really have to like that shit. I agree. I should clarify too. I don't. I don't think uh, like Fu adds. St- he still trains, but okay. they were just talking. Like he's just focused more on running now because yeah, yeah. it's like I can do this a lot better naturally, <clears throat> and I can almost kind of be competitive in it. I can set up a race for myself. Mm-hmm. The lifting's still there, and they love it, obviously. Um, so yeah, I don't want to misspeak on his behalf. Is the only thing. But yeah, for sure, that's huge. Like it should just be to help you with your sport. Yeah. You know, you shouldn't be. It, it would be dumb to do steroids and work out because you're on steroids. You know, I think that's kind of what you're saying. <laughs> but yeah. I know some people know. who have done that. Like they they mm. they hopped on, they did a cycle or whatever, yeah. and, and they like, barely train. And yep, once <laughs> they came off, they don't train because it's they don't feel the same mm. way as they feel when training mm-hmm. when they're on some shit. Easy to do too, because yeah, you go from feeling great, the move the the weight is moving better, you got the aggression, mm-hmm. and all that goes away, and that's when you got to dig into that willpower and that you probably don't have because you didn't set it up before getting into there, you know? Yeah. So I think we can all, like yesterday I worked out with, uh, like, you know, I'm just on plain TRT right now. Worked out with Smokey and my buddy yesterday and they're both bigger than me. I didn't take any pre-workout. It was, I'm three hours back. It was late at night. So mm-hmm. I'm, but I had an amazing workout because I knew how to tap into that motivation that I have, you know? Yeah. And that's what some people don't learn how to do when they're looking for the pill or the injection to get that. And, you know, that's everything in life, business, school, all that there's no quick fix. You gotta suck it up and do the work. You know, I do wish people would put way more emphasis <clears> on that, <throat> and that's something I am trying to talk to. A lot of the patients come in. Like I said, a lot of them are pretty dialed in, and they're mm-hmm. kind of looking for that extra few percent, which is cool. But when we do get the occasional younger guy in, it is kind of nice too to, that they're coming. They're obviously proactive about this stuff. They chose us over the one that's just going to write them a script, and so I can sit down and talk to them about like, let's figure out your nutrition, man. Let's figure out your diet. Like, let's figure out how you're training, how you're sleeping. You're, who you're hanging out with, what supplements you're taking, how much water, you're, like that stuff means so much too. Mm-hmm. I do like to be able to make that impact on people's lives. I would like everybody just to try something. Just Me go, too. Just go into the gym and do like three sets of something. Lap pull downs, dumbbell presses, have about a minute rest in between sets, do about 10 reps, pick a weight that's appropriate for you. Go in for that day without a pre-workout. Yeah. When you're done with just those couple sets, you're usually all set to work out. Yeah. Throw on some good music right. and fucking have a party. Like I, I love I love pre-workout. I love caffeine. I like all this stuff. It's good to get hyped up. It's good to do some of this stuff all the time uh, here and there. But you don't necessarily need it. Like yeah. if you go in the gym and just start moving around, 
uh, you're, that's where the motivation a lot of times kicks in. Yeah. I know some, me anyway. some like elite lifters and, um, athletes and stuff, they will purposely train alone, like with no music, no pre-workout. And so that when they get to meet day, when they can employ all that stuff, deploy all that stuff they rather that they do extra. that. Yeah. And like, um, CrossFitter, uh, Josh Bridges, you know, like Navy SEAL dude, he <laughs> always talks about doing like no music by himself in the garage, just like suffering, you know, <laughs> putting yourself in that pain cave. It's a lot easier yeah. to do when you got the whole gym firing you up and the music's cranking and you mm -hmm. pounded some dry scoop, some Jack 3d, you know, <laughs> like it's easy to get going, but it's yeah. really hard to tap into that, that to be like, this sucks and I'm going to hang out in there. Mm -hmm. And that's where like the cold plunge and stuff that you guys are doing, that's uh, like the scientific term would be basically like stress resilience, like increasing that epinephrine and hanging out in it and being like, I want to run out of this, but I'm not going to, mm -hmm. I'm going to sit here and endure the pain. And that helps. And it trickles down, I think. And you've probably seen it too, like in, in business and things like things get shitty sometimes life sucks sometimes. And the people who make it through the other end are the ones that just, you know, they stick it out. They work hard and they deal with the suck and then they rep, they, they get all the, the benefit. Too many people these days, I think, as soon as things hurt, they turn away, you mm. know, and they, they think that they, they just need something to push. They need a little bit of a buffer, be it a drug or, or something to push them through the painful. But I think we should embrace the suck a little bit more personally. Yeah. What's the uh, price point at, at for, uh, the thing that we offer for Mar Maric Health, like what, project panel. Yeah, yeah. How much? That. About how much is that? And and uh, like, was what are they getting? So let's look it up right now because I don't know it right off the top of my head. Let's see. And I don't oh. either. And so, and well, you guys offer a lot of different things. Yeah, yeah. this is but just a, a it's actually really nice special thing. That we um, offer I actually don't know how much anything costs, and I think <laughs> I don't know if they set it up that way purposely, but I do like it because. I'm not dictated by a oh. number sign, you know? Mm -hmm. It's not like the insurance companies where, because people are like, well, how much is that going to cost? I'm like, dude, I'm sorry. I don't know. Like, PCC will handle that. Uh -huh. But I do like that. But I sometimes I'm, I wish I knew something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sorry. I know I just had to pull it up. No, but so yours? for the uh, the Power Project panel, now this covers literally everything that you're going to need to know, like what's going on under the hood. Um, and the, the like really, really awesome thing about this panel is that it comes with like a, a lab an analysis with somebody with a client care coordinator. So that's like the really big thing. Cause like we could all go get our labs done, but to interpret those, it's like, Oh well, yeah. no, my test is only like 200 or whatever. You know, like then like I need testosterone. It's like, well, what about your free test? Right? right. Like what are some of these other underlying issues that you might have? So that's the important thing about our panel. And uh, so for that, it's 500 bucks, but with promo code power project, you save $101 off of that. So you're getting a shit ton of work done, plus somebody that's going to interpret everything all for under 500 bucks or 400 bucks. 26 different labs. 26 yeah. different labs. So that's a yeah. shit ton of stuff. So testosterone, estrogen, your cholesterol, all of that stuff that you're going to need to know. I've been ordering labs for myself since 2015, I think every six months. Wow. And before coming to Merrick, I didn't. I, I wasn't really a follower of Derek or anything. I didn't really know what Merrick was before Derek reached out to me. But I would hear rumor because I'm kind of in the space that like Merrick was the place to go to for cheaper labs. Mm -hmm. So I do think that's a relatively good deal. And I'm not just saying that because I'm obviously biased. So take that with a grain of salt. Though, <laughs> you know, I've utilized all of them, and I do know that Merrick consistently is kind of the cheaper ones, at least for the labs. Mm -hmm. I don't know what it comes to when you're paying for medication and stuff. Mm -hmm. I don't know. But uh, but as far as labs go, if you just want to get a look under the hood, like you said, mm -hmm. that's a great deal because I've spent a lot going through those other companies too. Mm -hmm. Always searching for promo codes and things. And, <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, and, and then trying to get it through just like uh, whether it be your insurance, it's a pain in the dick because yeah. the doctor is not going to order damn near anything. So if you have to go out of pocket, I mean, at least in California, it's kind of it's very expensive. Yeah, and there are other places but like the thing that we like about America is it's like the premium telehealth clinic. Yeah, like you can go to some of these like. They're not underground because they have a website, but they kind of treat you like an underground lab where it they're is. just going to th throw some needles at you. Like, yeah. It's a lot different here. Yeah. And I like what you said about the interpretation. Like I, in 2015, you know, I was in my education. I was, I kind of knew what I was looking for. A lot of people don't. And so they might be mm -hmm. massively mm -hmm. interpreting or like uninterpreting or misinterpreting. I mean, misinterpreting is the word. They might be massively misinterpreting the, uh, the lab results. Mm -hmm. And so it is nice to get teamed up with a patient care coordinator mm -hmm. who can potentially put you towards a physician too, which is awesome. Because um, there, I'm, even then, even when I was in school, some of the things that I know now, I'm like, man, I should have caught that earlier. 
you know, my kidneys weren't doing so good when mm-hmm. I thought they were fine, you know, or maybe it was actually probably vice versa. But that's what's cool about working with Merrick too, is we do work with athletes and things and we understand where your your doc might see your kidney values and be like, you're in kidney failure. And then, you know, we are like, no, you're not. You're just a muscular dude who worked mm-hmm. out yesterday. Yeah. And that's why we're getting these kidney readings. And then like, just to put you at peace of mind, let's order something like a cystatin C. I guarantee like nine out of 10 uh, primary carers won't know what that is, mm-hmm. you know, that it's a better marker. And on top of that, I was just working out with my buddy came and joined us yesterday and he was like, my doctor will not order a cystatin C for me. He won't do it. I've been begging him. And this guy's a dentist. He's, he's well, he knows too. Uh, he knows what to look for, and, but mm-hmm. he's been begging Kaiser which you guys have here in mm-hmm. California to order it and they won't do it. It's crazy. Just like they won't order the lipoprotein little A and things. Like I do like the fact that we give people, um, we kind of give them the power over their own health. That's that like kind of like libertarian that I talked about. Like I do understand that can be dangerous. Some people will misinterpret them and take the wrong measures, mm-hmm. but still that's their choice. Yeah. We can't tell people like, if we're going to say my body, my choice, it should be for everything, including mm-hmm. Things like, you know, what you get put into your body mm-hmm. and, you know, what you decide to put into your body yourself, things yeah. like that. You know, I do I do feel that way personally, but that's not the uh, views of Merrick but necessarily, but my own. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I don't want to misspeak for them. <laughs> <laughs> I know I'm representing them, but I think they're, 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 they would align with that. But, you know, I, that's a controversial subject. What's, his, yeah. what's the deal with uh, cr- uh, creatine or creatinine levels? Like it seems like every time anybody that like lifts uh-huh. and goes and gets a test done, Everyone's like this, or the, not everyone. The person that reads the labs are like, "This is really fucked up." Like, mm-hmm. yeah, it's ha- yeah, it's happened to me. Yeah, yeah. what's uh, what's the deal with that? Are we gonna die? No, <laughs> that, yeah, that's that's what I was saying. That, and a better reading would be to get that cystatin C, that kidney measure, and look to see what your actual uh, what what's happening like with the nephrons in the actual kidney. So. It's going to be elevated if you have, even if you just have excess muscle mass, it'll probably be negatively elevated. Um, mm-hmm. If you worked out, it will definitely be elevated because there's going to be protein filtering through. It's going to put some strain on the kidneys. Um, and then if you're taking creatine, which most of us are in our pre-workout and things, even if we're not deliberately taking it, it's usually in a pre-workout or yeah. intra-workout, uh, you're probably going to have some uh, elevations on that level. And so for the athletic population, we need to take that kind of thing into consideration. Same thing happens on liver markers. So the liver mar- enzymes will be elevated due to a workout. So I, I, one thing too, I tell like a lot of people is if you are going to get labs, like to get the most out of your money, probably don't work out for like three to four days before. Things like light w- walking or light cardio and things should be fine, but don't get under heavy weights. Don't be doing those uh, sets to failure and things. Because that mm. is going to just... It's going to skew the results a bit. Yeah, so my shit's you, been really jacked. Up. Exactly, because you probably never take some. Yeah, just no. Yeah. I'm not gonna ever stop. Right, <laughs> I've never done a lab where I've not worked out three days before. So yeah, you're you probably know? not getting a, a shit. I think like, like your C-reactive protein 15. This is impossible. You yeah, should have died yeah. three weeks ago. Exactly. But is it maybe more accurate? Because if they were yeah. to stop working out, that's very abnormal as opposed to continuing to work out every day. Yeah, but I, I just uh, those those apparitions in the lab work aren't negative ones per se, but they're they're looking that way. So I would say that if you took like a week off and you got labs and your kidneys are still effed, like mm. there might be we need to do some further investigation. Oh, so we get a better look into things. And blood work is about comparison. So like if yeah. if if they were just like, hey, go ahead and work out and do whatever. All three of us are going to work out quite differently, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and then and each time we're going to work out differently. So they're trying to compare your blood because that's the whole thing with getting the blood work done. It's good to have a first reading, yeah. but it's really important to have you have follow up blood work, yeah. and you're trying to improve some of those markers. I'm right? huge on that. Yeah, I think it's that's the most beneficial thing is to have as much data as you can. Mm-hmm. I like to be able to look back. I wish I started before 2015, but mine is 2015 and now, and I have I can. If I wanted to get real nerdy with it, you know, I could put it in spreadsheets and make trends. I don't know how to do that stuff, so I don't, but it would be cool. Um, hopefully one day, like, Merrick gets an app or something that does that because I think that would be awesome. That would be. If mm-hmm. you could just continually get blood and then it's thrown into it and you can see trends, it would be awesome for diets and things too. People make these crazy claims, like, show me the lab work that shows that that six-month period where all you ate with meat had positive effects. Maybe it didn't, you know, or sleep or work. You know, you can look. I do tell people, like, some people come to us and – everything's perfect. And I'm like, don't look at this as like, obviously you shouldn't look at it as a bad thing. Mm -hmm. But sometimes I feel a little guilty. Like, I'm sorry you came to us and like, you're good. But the really cool thing is that you got all this awesome labs, you know? And like, let's have that as a set point. And now you know. 
And then say in six months when you get it again, if you maybe you've been busting your ass at work and you're only getting four hours of sleep a night and things have changed, you can point at that because that was the variable that changed, you know, and you mm-hmm. have this this data point. People um, want to be messed up. Yeah, they do. Kind of, yeah. mm-hmm. <laughs> it is testosterone was low. Mm-hmm. Yes, I know. I, know. <laughs> I do. Score. I do think sometimes they're like, yeah, I hope my testosterone is low. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there there, even, there was an ease of mind for me because like when I got my first set of laps from Merrick done, I don't know if it was three years ago now, maybe two and a half or three years ago, I never really had consistent lab work done. And I was like, I wonder if anything is just off. You know, my grandfather died of diabetes. I was just wondering, is there anything weird going on? And everything was cool. And I was like, okay, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm good. I got yeah. really nothing to worry about. It's nice so, to know that everything you're doing day in and day out is paying off too, yeah. right? Because you probably put a lot of work into this, you know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, but, oh, cool. That makes you know, sense. Like, yeah, the mirror is one thing, but we do know that the mirror isn't everything. Like mm-hmm. that's why bodybuilders they look great in the mm-hmm. mirror, but they're dying because the insides aren't good, you know. So it is nice to get that look under the hood, as he said. I, I like that term because it's true, and I like all kinds of data points. Like I was even uh, just the other day, I took off my continuous uh, glucose monitor. Have you guys messed around with those at all? I haven't used it. I don't they're like fun. prick and shit. No, it's not bad. I thought so too. I was yeah. all afraid. It took me like five minutes to get the courage. It's weird because I inject other shit. <laughs> <laughs> I think just the process of it, it makes a noise and it's yeah, kind of scary. Not, I didn't even yeah. feel it. I'm yeah, afraid have you done it? No, um, I was going to, but I'm just afraid I'm going to get it caught on something and it's going to like just jack. I don't I, know. It just, it, it weirds me out a I didn't, bit. but uh, I thought uh, Jason Kalipa said he wore one and he does Brazilian jiu-jitsu, you know, and so huh. really? he said he put it on his abdomen and then put some rock tape over it and then it was fine. Well, I guess the gi or whatever was there. I, don't know. I didn't catch mine on anything. It mm-hmm. wasn't bad, mm-hmm. um, but it's fun to try. It's cool. Mm-hmm. Uh I recently saw a doctor though, like talking bad about it, like, um, like you know, people who don't have diabetes have no no right wearing this. It's just stupid. I'm like, why? Why would that be stupid to let somebody get a look at their health? You know, like we've had patients come in. Just uh, one, I, I talked to him, and he was like, my wife for years has made this soup that we think is really healthy, but that was the one thing that shoots my blood my oh, blood sugar shit. like out of the range and crazy. And he was actually trending towards. I think he was in the pre diabetic category too. That's why we gave him one. Like. Everything else seems dialed in with you. What's going on that's causing you to be this way? And so it can be interesting. Like, why wouldn't we give? And the craziest thing is those things are prescription only. Like, wow. to yeah, to get a look at how how foods impact your blood sugar, you have to go to a doctor and how, and pay it like a prescription. That's so dumb. Mm-hmm. I feel like you should just, I don't know, I don't get it. Especially when you can do a finger prick. That's not, that's over the counter. Huh? Yeah, right. Again, getting into the political BS of <laughs> medicine and, <clears throat> and anabolics and things, crazy. Andrew, take us on out of here, buddy. All righty. Thank you, everybody, for checking out today's episode. If you guys are ready to get optimized with Merrick, uh, make sure you guys head over to MerrickHealth.com. That's M-A-R-E-K Health.com. And uh, when you guys are checking out, if you guys do like uh, order your own labs, make sure you, you use power code PowerProject10 to save 10% off all of those labs. Uh, links to everything down in the description as well as the podcast show notes. Uh, please drop some comments down below, maybe some more questions about testosterone that we can address in a future episode. Hopefully, we can get to all of them. And uh, subscribe if you guys are not subscribed already please follow the podcast at mb power project on instagram tiktok and twitter my instagram tiktok and twitter's at i am andrew z and sima where you at go down to the description check out discord because i'm pretty sure at this point there's over 1400 people in there it's popping mm-hmm. so at and sima ending on instagram and youtube at and sima yinning on tiktok and twitter adam where can they find you uh where can they find me <laughs> 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 um at doctor period a e hotchkiss H O T C H K I S S, or just Merrick Health. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, we'll we'll link it down in the description. I'm really not as that well. cool. You're, I, I have a new puppy, and that's mainly what you're going to see. Is, nice. is, uh, a lot of my puppy right now. Yeah, but uh, yeah, I would love to see you guys at Merrick. Though it would be awesome. But follow Don't me you. if you want. It, mm-hmm. it could it could make me feel cooler than there I am. You go. Hopefully, yeah, yeah, we'll make it happen. Thank you. Thank you so much for your time. They really appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, thanks, man. I'm um, at Mark Smelly Bell. Strength is never weakness. Weakness is never strength. Catch you guys later. Bye. Where's the puppy? Oh, you don't see him? No, you're looking for the puppy. I don't see him yet. I just see you and your hair.